Um, so good morning. Um, on behalf of the New York Society for Surgery of the Hand, um, I would like to welcome you all to our, the 2022 Hand Surgery Review course. Uh, we have approximately 450 registrants for this course from throughout the United States and internationally. Uh, I myself, as well as Dr. Renata Weber, are the uh, course directors for this course. And this is our course faculty. Um, I would like to thank all of our esteemed course faculty for their time and commitment to make this uh, course possible. Uh, all the faculty are members of the New York Society for Surgery of the Hand and represent the top health systems throughout the metropolitan area. Uh, these, uh, these are the lectures that both the live and uh, pre-recorded lectures, and the pre-recorded lectures are available at the nyssh.org uh, website, which I'll show you afterwards how to access. So I wanna give everybody for our registrants a little background on the New York Society for Surgery of the Hand. Uh, the New York Society for Surgery of the Hand was organized in the early 1960s when a small group of surgeons met for dinner to develop professional contact among like-minded individuals in an informal social setting. This was in addition to the ASSH, the American Society for Surgery of the Hand. As such, it was the first regional hand surgery society of its kind and was the prototype for other similar groups throughout the country. It has grown to represent a present size of 120 members and it is the largest regional hand society in the United States. It still embodies the purpose of the founding members in promoting camaraderie and exchange of knowledge amongst hand surgeons. Article two of the society's constitution states that its mission is, quote, to promote and foster the highest standards of surgery of the hand, to promote education, training, and research related to surgery of the hand. And that is why we host this course every two years. Um, this course is a biannual course that the NYSSH runs to educate residents, fellows, physicians, physician assistants, OTCHTs, and other medical professionals who are involved in the care of the hand and upper extremity. Up until two years ago, this course was held at Columbia University. We usually had approximately 75 to 100 registrants and to defray the cost of running the course, course in person, we had to charge regi registrants. Two years ago, because of COVID restrictions, Dr. Dan Pollich, who was then the NYSSH president, made this a free Zoom webinar. The course was a resounding success with approximately 700 registrants from throughout the world. We received excellent feedback for the course. Because of the success of this course and the wide reach that we were able to achieve um, by doing this online, it was decided to continue this course as a free live webinar. I would like to uh, thank my friend and colleague, Dr. Dan Pollich, for all the legwork that he did two years ago. Today's course is a testament to his foresight and hard work. This is the lecture. This is the schedule of today's lectures. We will try to stay on time. After the first session, we'll have a Q&A session, uh, a break for 20 minutes if we stay on time, and the second, uh, session will be uh, led by uh, Dr. Renata Weber, my um, co-host. As I said before, there are 10 pre-recorded lectures. These are the pre-recorded lectures and you can access these online. Essentially what you need to do is you need to go to the NYSSH website, nyssh.org, and then you find these lectures and you click on the play button to the right and then the lecture will come up and you play it. Uh, please note that because the lectures are uploaded onto the YouTube channel, um, you may be directed to sign into YouTube because some of these lectures are age restricted because of the medical content. So all you need to do is sign into YouTube either using your Gmail or YouTube account and uh, you'll be able to access all the lectures. I think two or three of these are restricted. Um, finally, I would like to thank our sponsors, East River Imaging, Dr. Larry Hurst, Hand Surgery Resource, um, online website, MedArtist, Skeletal Dynamics, and Stryker. Uh, each of these have each of these companies have donated funds to help the NYSSH defray the costs of uh, running this course, and has allowed us to uh, keep it free to all registrants. Okay, that's it for my introduction. It's time to start. Our first lecture will be given by Dr. Kate Nellens, who is now the secretary of the NYSSH. And she's one of my colleagues and friends as well, as she works at Northville, and she'll be lecturing on fractures of the hand. So Kate, I am gonna stop sharing and turn it over to you. 
And I'm going to ask everybody to uh, mute themselves until you're lecturing. Thank you. All right. So welcome, everyone. Happy Saturday morning. Uh, we get to start with some uh, finger and metacarpal trauma. So for this, I really tried to um, think about the high yield topics for the OITE, things commonly missed in the ER, um, and some basic treatment. <clears throat> Again, we're not going into any depth in any single um, kind of problem, um, mostly an overview of these traumatic injuries to the fingers of the metacarpals. So here we go. Um, so kind of starting distal and going proximal. Um, mallet finger is really common. Um, again, a soft tissue mallet is where the extensor tendon uh, pulls off the insertion on the distal phalanx. Uh, splinting is by far the you know kind of majority of our uh, treatment. Um, again, eight to twelve weeks of splinting. Um, a question I saw recently was complications in splinting are about fifty percent. These are mostly skin uh, problems. Um, bony mallets, um, you know, kind of come in two different uh, types. Um, obviously, you know, the more joint uh, involvement there is, the greater chance that you have the subluxation, um, but it's not necessarily um, a given. So on the left there, you see a um, bony mallet with about 50% of the joint involved, but there's no subluxation. Those would do very, very well with splinting. But on the right, you see that volar subluxation of the distal phalanx, the gapping at the articular surface, and that's when operative indications are, are, are appropriate. Um, no one uh, operative indication or operative uh, technique is probably better than the other. And again, those have about 50% complications with, you know, um, prominent uh, pins, pin site infections, um, or problems with the anchors. Um, so again, uh, minor 50% complications with splinting, um, kind of more major 50% complications with surgery. Those are kind of just some numbers to remember. And why do we treat this? Um, it's really the risk of the developing a swan neck. Not everyone will, um, but uh, and Dr. Posner was going to go into this, I'm sure, quite a bit more. Um, but the idea is that you know we're trying to avoid this this positioning. All right. So moving on to uh, kind of an adolescent type of injury, Seymour fractures. Um, they like to put this on there because this is a kind of a do not miss type of injury in the ER. Um, and so what you're really looking for in a picture or kind of clinically is that that nail is elongated and kind of outlined here. Um, uh, that the nail is kind of just longer. And what's happening is that the germinal matrix is matrix becomes interposed at the physis. And so if this goes unreduced, one, you're going to have a nail deformity and two, it's an open type of injury. Um, and you can end up with, a, you know, an osteomyelitis. These are easy to miss, um, but the treatment is really reduction, pinning if necessary. Um, but the key is just identification. So kind of moving on to other injuries that happen at the fingertips, Jersey fingers. Um, I would tell you that this is the one classification uh, in orthopedics, it seems, where type one is the worst. So these type one uh, injuries are where the tendon retracts all the way back into the palm. Uh, these need to be addressed urgently, um, really within seven to 10 days. Um, and if they get missed, lots of times it's just an FTP excision and they end up with you know, the, the ability to make a fist all the way over on the right side because they can't have pull through through the DIP. Uh, a type two is somewhere retracted within the finger. Um, an MRI can be helpful or an ultrasound. Um, type threes are where you have a bony avulsion and those actually do very, very well. Even surgery um, a little bit further out um, have the good outcomes. Um, but mostly it's just remembering that this classification system, uh, one is the most severe and is really urgent in terms of operative indications. Uh, what you don't want to do operatively is kind of open this all up. Um, they're going to get very stiff and scarred. Um, the idea is that we're kind of threading the uh, FDP tendon through um, with minimal incisions. So don't do that. All right, so moving on to dislocations. So I would tell you 90% of PIP dislocations are simple. Um, they go dorsal. It's a hyperextension type injury. Um, they need a reduction. You need to avoid hyperextension um, kind of going forward. And then you start early motion. Um, a volar PIP dislocation is much different. It's a bad actor. Um, and what, it, what it's doing, if you kind of look at that um, uh, x-ray, is it's going to disrupt your central slip. And so an unrecognized volar dislocation um, goes on to a boutonniere. Um, and that's, that's pretty serious. So 
you know, splinting that in extension for four weeks is very different from your dorsal dislocations. And so just kind of, it's not, you know, you need to know whether it's dorsal or volar if um, a patient's coming in from the ER and said they had a, a PIP dislocation because it really does change treatment and outcomes. So moving on to these fractured dislocations, I would tell you that when these walk into my office, I'm never happy. I don't think any of us are. These are hard injuries. Um, however, um, we kind of think about it as stability based on the a degree of articular involvement. So anything kind of at the you know 25% or less is pretty stable. We try and get those moving. Um, unstable fractures need surgery urgently. So the most common we see um, are these little volar plate avulsion fractures. I try and tell parents we treat these as more of like a, uh, a PIP sprain. Um, we get them moving. Um, we avoid the hyperextension type of uh, mechanism by buddy strapping, um, but that's really about it. These are not major. But injuries like this, if you catch it at three days, we've got options. And I'll thank Dr. Strouch for uh, this technique. Um, <clears throat> Really uh, restoring the articular surface, uh, reducing the subluxation um, that you see here over on the right hand side are kind of all things that we're um, kind of focusing on. So other options, um, you can do this external frame wiring um, that creates kind of uh, both longitudinal traction and um, volar uh, translation uh, to kind of reduce the articular surface, create some movement. Um, and try and get that, that PIP joint uh, reduced and concentric. However, these never seem to uh, make it into my office within a couple of days. And so these three week out uh, PIP dislocations um, are I think especially frustrating. So what we're looking for and kind of our eye is seeing in these x-rays is there's dorsal subluxation, um, but there's articular impaction and really poor molar bone stock. And so these are the injuries that need um, kind of some special work. Um, I would tell you historically, uh, volar plate arthroplasty is written about. I would tell you for the OITE, that's never going to be the right answer. It's going to be a distractor. It sounds fancy, um, but that's really all it is. It's just taking the volar plate and tucking it into the fracture. It doesn't work particularly well. So, <clears throat> you know, I think the correct answer for kind of these chronic ones now is going to be this hemi-hamate autograft. Um, so taking the portion of the hemi -ham or the hamate um, at the interval between the fourth and fifth uh, CMC, and then kind of inserting it into that um, uh, bony defect. It works well. It's a little technically demanding, um, but it's definitely the right way to go. Here's a couple of pictures. Um, kind of using the anatomy that's uh, you know already in the hand. I think this is one of my favorite parts about hand surgery um, and kind of creating uh, a new joint there. There's some just, you know, kind of follow up. So it, it does match quite, quite well. So I guess moving on to some more standard uh, finger fractures. Uh, as you know, the OITE really likes to think about the anatomy um, and the deforming forces. I think there are a lot of questions about that. We'll have some going, you know, just in a little bit. Um, but these proximal phalanx fractures, they go apex volar, um, and so do the middle phalanx fractures, but for different reasons. So um, for the proximal phalanx, you're really thinking about the central slip and the lateral bands being your deforming force, whereas the middle phalanx, which is that picture down on the bottom, um, the apex volar de deformity is really due to the pull of the FDS, um, which is kind of the more proximal angle, that arrow there, um, as well as the terminal extensor tendon um, kind of pulling into extension there. All right, coming back to the thumb now. Um, so these ulnar collateral ligament injuries really come sports injury um, and in the acute setting. Um, if it's opening less than about 30 degrees, uh, it's probably not a complete injury. You certainly can get an MRI, but these are reasonable to splint and let heal. If it's opening more than 30 degrees or great, 15 degrees greater than the contralateral side, that's when you're going to get concerned about a full injury. Um, and what happens is that the collateral ligament uh, is displaced by the adductor um, and then can't lay back down next to the bone. And so um, kind of something that looks like this is going to be your clue um, that the, the collateral ligament there is now outside of the adductor and can't lay back down and can't heal. Um, you can get a little avulsion fracture. Um, and I would tell you that as a resident, I always had a hard time kind of looking at what a sesamoid was and what a, what a tiny little avulsion fracture is, but you can look for a bite out of the proximal phalanx there. But then also 
this is going to have a sharp edge where a sesamoid is going to be nice and smooth and around. So um, they can often be a little bit the same size, but um, uh, kind of looking for those sharp edges and a bite out of the proximal phalanx is going to be your clue uh, kind of as, you know, for the test if you're looking at um, an x-ray and trying to figure out what the injury is. Okay, so moving on to dislocation. So this is a, you know, a common adolescent injury um, and really kind of what's kind of thinking about what's interposed there. Um, and for these, it's usually gonna be your sesamoid and, uh, entrapment. Um, and again, this is kind of pattern recognition that the MCP of the thumb is hyperextended um, and the sesamoid is kind of sitting right uh, in line with the metacarpal. Um, kind of moving on to index finger uh, uh, dislocations. Um, you know, I think these are frustrating for us as uh, surgeons uh, because oftentimes if treated correctly, um, it doesn't require going to the operating room, um, but inevitably somebody is on the field, uh, you know, these are usually sports injuries or is gonna try and pull on it or the, the you know, the patient themselves is gonna pull on it. Um, but what's happening is that um, we got interposition and then kind of a locking down. So this is a common, uh, question I've seen come up a couple of times. So I wanted to put it in here and kind of talk it through. So, you know, this index finger here, the MCP is dislocated. You can kind of see the finger floating off without anything underneath it. Um, and what's happening is that in this hyperextension injury, the volar plate becomes interposed at the MCP joint, but those natatory ligaments <clears throat> um, really kind of create this um, noose around the metacarpal neck. And then the superficial transverse ligament is kind of the underneath portion of it. So it's really, I think, um, kind of knowing your anatomy here, kind of memorizing this, these kind of um, specific anatomy uh, questions um, because they do come up over and over. Um, all right, so metacarpal fractures, I think this is probably the most common fracture we see as a hand surgeon. Um, it's always gonna be some teenage boy punches a wall. Um, uh, but these metacarpal fractures, I think the thinking on these have, has changed significantly over the past 10 to 15 years. So in general, all options are reasonable. Um, 30 to 70 degrees of angulation, um, non-op, um, any sort of fixation you want. Um, but we know biomechanically it's not particularly um, uh, different, but at the same time, it's well tolerated. Um, however, um, and I think this is going to start making it into the... Um, uh, kind of testing material. Um, but in December, 2020, there's kind of a, a randomized trial looking at buddy strapping versus cast for these uh, fifth metacarpal fractures. And I think kind of the bite out of it is really that if you treat with buddy strapping, patients are back to work almost a month earlier. Um, and that that's like a very, I think, easy testable question, but it's also kind of changes my management completely. Um, these rarely get casts anymore, we get them moving. We do know that greater than 70 degrees of angulation does biomechanically impair them and, and they do have kind of prominence dorsally and, and difficulty with grip. Um, lots of different ways to treat it, but I think these intermedullary screws are becoming more and more common. Um, I'm a big fan. Um, and I think at, at this point, they do have some of the lowest incidence of complications because of limited incision um, going in. And we've all gotten better at placing them. Um, so I think, uh, you know, this is my preferred uh, treatment for those really highly angulated neck fractures. So moving on to kind of down the metacarpals here, um, we get concerned about these CMC dislocations because they are commonly missed. And if you, you're looking at the AP here, it doesn't look terrible. Um, but if you're seeing this in the ER, the hand is big, it is swollen, you know something's wrong, but it's hard to kind of tell. And so I think when one thing that is, is nice and to think about is looking at the lateral, um, and yes, everything's overlapped, but if you kind of start allowing your eye to see this intermetacarpal angle, so the IMA, um, it's gonna be off. It's gonna be off by about 20 degrees. Um, so even if things are overlapped, if you're kind of starting to see that they're not all perfectly lined up, that's gonna be your indication that there's probably something going on at the ulnar CMC joints. Um, CT scan is never a wrong answer on this one if you're concerned, but the treatment is gonna be an open reduction internal fixation. Um, the deforming force on this is really the ECU. It's pulling at the base of the, um, the fourth and fifth metacarpals, uh, continuing to kind of approximately pull on this and, um, and uh, keep, keep it dislocated. And these are, you know, even if you reduce them in the ER, they kind of, can come back out. So that's why um, open reduction and is usually our, um, 
are kind of going to be our answer for the test at least. Okay, so I feel like these are metacarpal base fractures and um, CMC fractures of the thumb are really commonly tested, um, mostly because it's good anatomy um, in terms of the deforming forces. So um, I think, you know, this is an extra articular fracture. I think we need to recognize that. These are extremely well tolerated, um, but not if it's greater than 30 degrees. So that's kind of our um, threshold. Um, there's not, you know, lots of different options, but really our deforming forces in terms of what the fracture ends up where it is, is that, you know, the, um, it ends up being an apex dorsal because of the pull of the APL there. And then the APB is pulling the distal fragment. Um, as well as the adductor, and then the th thumb tends to supinate. So you're going to reverse all these for the reduction, and then usually K-wires will do it. So Bennett fractures are going to be the, uh, you know, the similar type of mechanism, um, but it's intraarticular fracture. And so <clears throat> you have to remember that the majority of the trapezium, the metacarpal separates off from the trapezium. It leaves this small articular fragment behind, so it, it's attached to the volar beak ligament, um, uh, and that's the constant fragment. So your displacing forces for this one are your um, APL, EPL, um, EPB, and adductor. Um, so here's kind of a, you know, what they usually ask for is either the deforming forces or, you know, what's the reduction maneuver. maneuver. Um, so it's going to be your axial traction, your palmar abduction again, trying to kind of um, counteract these deforming forces, pronation of the thumb. Um, and then pressure kind of over top to reduce it. Um, so this is that beak ligament that we talk about right there. Okay, and kind of um, kind of thinking about treatment, uh, K wires are usually kind of the um, easiest, most straightforward way to do this, especially if you're cutting it early. I think mostly important is that you're not necessarily trying to um, capture this uh, small uh, constant fragment. You're reducing the metacarpal to that fragment to get a uh, concentric articular reduction. Okay, and that was a whirlwind through hand fractures. I'm going to finish up a little bit earlier. We um, can have plenty of questions at the end. So our next. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name, my name is Omri Ilon. Uh, can you guys see my screen? All good. Yes. Sweet. See okay, you. Hold this up. Great. There we go. Yeah. So I'm I'm um, representing uh, Manhattan Orthopedics, and then my uh, I'm also uh, the associate uh, fellowship director at NYU, and it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to be here um, giving this lecture with the NIS NYSSH. And um, so let's let's get right into it. I sadly have no disclosures to report. So I'm gonna be talking about scaphoid fractures and um, uh, oh, oh, basically- oh, We see you, but we don't see your, your sharing of the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. So if you go to the bottom, there's share screen. There you go. Sorry, I hit the wrong. Uh, one second. How's that? Good. Yeah, you just have to open up slideshow now, and we should be good. We can see your oh, screen because I'm sharing. Okay, yay. Start your slideshow by going to this lower box. Yeah. Yeah. Can okay. you see that now? Yep. All right. Okay. All right, let's get started. So I'm going to be talking about um, scaphoid fractures, no disclosures. Um, Omri, we can't hear you. I think you muted yourself. Oh my gosh. Yeah, good. How's that better? Is that better? Perfect. Okay. So it comes from the Greek, which I don't think um, Andy Sandberg was thinking about when he first uh, made this, this, uh, this song. Here we go. All right. So my goal today is to hopefully confuse you because this topic 
unfortunately, does not have a huge amount of um, consensus. However, um, I would like to give you the tools needed to think about these injuries and treat them effectively. So hopefully we can at least answer why we treat these and how best to treat scaphoid fractures. So let's get started here. It will end up as being more of a philosophical debate when we get done. So some of the barriers to treating these injuries and, eval and evaluating them, unfortunately, is there's no consensus from start to finish. So even proper diagnosis, which imaging modality, uh, how to define displacement, how to define union of a scaphoid fracture, um, even the type of non-operative treatment or surgical indications. So, um, you know, pretty much uh, we might as well just throw our hands in the air, but let's, um, let's try to, to move forward. So why do we even treat scaphoid fractures? And I think that um, sometimes we get caught up in, you know, um, cool surgical techniques and um, how to how best to fix these injuries. However, what we're really trying to do is to prevent um, prevent collapse of the carpus because, as we'll talk about, the scaphoid is the link between the proximal and distal rows. And when that link becomes disrupted, uh, we can tend down a uh, predefined set of collapse called the scaphoid non-union advanced collapse or snack wrist. So let's talk about the scaphoid. It's a funny bone. People describe it as a twisted peanut. Um, there's two concavities in two different planes. It's covered by greater than 80% with cartilage and it articulates with uh, five bones in the wrist. The vascularity always comes up in, um, in testing set, uh, uh, scenarios. And I tried to highlight uh, some of the ones that are more commonly tested. So the majority of the, of the vascularity is retrograde from the dorsal carpal branch of the radial artery. Um, and that's the distal 80% of the bone. And then the proximal, which is the more avascular section um, can be supplied by branches from the volar, uh, the superficial palmar arch, as well as the anterior interosseous artery. And you can see this, this image of injection studies, which commonly um, is in papers that, that does show the lack of vascularity in the proximal pole. So in terms of thinking about non-union rates, um, these, these, these numbers definitely do come up in testing and also is important clinically. You can see that it progresses as you get more proximal because of the uh, pattern of vascularity that we just talked about. Okay, so talking about the actual bone and the ligamentous uh, insertions that function essentially as deforming forces, um, most notably, I would pay attention to the dorsal ridge where the scaphoid ligament um, attaches, as well as you have the volar stabilizing ligaments, the RSC uh, and the scaphocapitate ligament as well. And so this can come into play with uh, fracture displacement as well as provides the uh, ligamentous stability in carpal mechanics. So I won't belabor carpal mechanics too much because I know we have a, a talk coming up about it. However, the important thing to know is that the scaphoid is the link between the proximal and the distal rows. And so when that, um, when that disruption occurs, you lose the uh, integrity of the carpal mechanics. So this, uh, this was a patient who uh, essentially has a trans scaphoid perilunate injury and just um, fixing the scaphoid essentially restores, <clears throat> restores the uh, normal carpal mechanics here, which is what, what you see here. And these are quite satisfying injuries to treat. Um, now, man, uh, evaluating these patients, um, you know, there's usually a fall and outstretched hand. Um, sometimes there's alcohol involved, sometimes not, but essentially there's pain on the radial side of the wrist. The problem is that um, there's lots of structures in that area and you need to be very specific about your history and your physical exam. Um, here are some basic findings. You know, it hurts to press on the snuff box, as well as the tubercle of the scaphoid, and you can have pain with pronation and also axial uh, compression can also help out determining this. So as a differential, looking at pain on the radial side of the wrist, um, you have the scaphoid ligament, you have FCR uh, pathology, either rupture or tendonitis, you have a, a fracture of the styloid, uh, CMC or SDT arthritis, Decor veins, or even radioscaphoid arthritis. So you need to be very specific with palpation even. And sometimes I use the, the tip of a pen with the, the end clicked out um, uh, to get a more accurate examination. Now, examining these patients with radiographs, 
Um, I think the, the, the importance cannot be overstressed of having good x-rays and specifically a lateral can be very helpful, not just for scaphoid fractures, but for carpal, um, other carpal pathologies. And I would just uh, try, to, try to be aware of the fact that you wanna get your pisiform over the distal pole of the scaphoid, which indicates a, an adequate lateral. And a scaphoid series, sometimes it's four or five images, but generally involves these, um, these imaging views that can help you fully evaluate. And most notably, the PA and ulnar deviation brings the scaphoid uh, fully upright so you can see the, um, the morphology of, of any fracture if present. This is a case example um, that sort of had equivocal, um, uh, equivocal findings on x-ray, which was, but I had a high uh, suspicion um, on, on physical exam. And so this brings up the whole topic of quote unquote occult fractures. Um, and so I think what's interesting is that there's also no consensus in the literature about how best to manage this. Historically, bone scans have been used to identify them. Um, I think that it's good practice to, uh, to bring the patient back in a week or two for repeat x-rays, um, as well as if you're thinking about getting an MR, uh, a higher level imaging, MRI tends to be better earlier and CT tends to be uh, better later. So you can keep that, that in mind. However, there is a true risk of uh, false positives. Oftentimes um, vascular channels can be read as a fracture and you should also take into uh, consideration the cost to the medical system of uh, routinely ordering these higher level imaging. If you do order imaging uh, for the scaphoid, I would urge you to speak to your radiologist and make sure that you order it in the plane of the scaphoid um, with small cuts, generally one millimeters if you can, because that will give you better diagnostic accuracy. So a word about classification, which I think is generally more for research purposes. However, these are two of the more commonly uh, reported ones. I think that the most important thing when you're looking at classifications is how it relates to clinical uh, use. And I think that uh, like we discussed, the more proximal the fracture, the higher suspicion you need to be and concern about non-union um, and greater trouble in the future. So speaking about union, you know, you think it'd be easy just to say, well, when, you know, when the bone is healed, you're good to go. However, there's no real uh, consensus on how to define this. And so um, some of the ways you can uh, define it is clinically with tenderness and pain, uh, serial x-rays, um, some people use the, the definition of 50% of bridging bone on CT. Um, the question uh, then arises, though, how do you then correlate that to clinical, um, clinical uh, situations? Um, <clears throat> okay, so treating these, treating these patients, okay, uh, I want to be very clear that most of these patients, uh, most of these injuries heal without surgery. You know, 90 to 95% of union has been reported um, with casting. Then the topic often comes up uh, with, you know, what type of cast, historically long arm cast with a thumb spica, and now we've sort of cut it all the way back to a short arm cast with no spica, and there hasn't really been shown to be any uh, appreciable difference, and I think that this is definitely in, pre in, in a testing environment, that's that's all well and good, but I think that you also have to keep in mind who you're treating. And um, if you need more stability, then I think that, uh, that using a short arm cast with a thumb spike extension is reasonable. So now let's talk about surgery. This is the fun part, you know? Um, there is definitely a trend towards fixing more of these and fixing these earlier um, with some data suggesting that there's earlier uh, return to work and even earlier union. However, as I discussed, the, the definition of union is not uh, widely agreed upon. And so I would just uh, look at these studies with a cautious eye. Um, there are some uh, suggestions that there's cost effectiveness of, of operating on these to get people back to work sooner, which I think may be true depending on the patient's um, occupation. So we're happy. However, um, you know, by the same token, you can find uh, studies that uh, report on the exact opposite. So this was a JBGS article in 2008 that essentially showed no difference when treating non-displaced um, scaphoid fractures. In fact, having slightly higher um, uh, complication rate in the, operative in the operative group. Now, if you, you'll notice that the STT arthritis can be uh, uh, a difference between clinical and radiographic arthrosis because of um, violating the STT joint to put the, uh, the screw in. So speaking more about surgery, I think that um, indications wise, if there's significant displacement, 
um, and there's a high likelihood of a non-unit, it, uh, it makes sense to fix these. Specifically, you'll hear about humpback deformity, and that happens because of those deforming forces and the bony um, morphology that we spoke about. Uh, a couple of the angles that you may see in the literature and on testing scenarios is the radiolunate angle, which you can see here, as well as the intrascaphoid angle. And these are just ways to define and describe union. Um, clinically uh, and practically, it's very difficult because these angles change based on the cut you're looking at in the scaphoid. So you need to be very um, diligent with your uh, surgical indications here. In general, um, you're trying to get um, hardware, generally a screw uh, center center, and you're trying to achieve abs absolute stability so we can get um, primary bone healing. As we know, the scaphoid tends towards non-union because of the fact that it's covered in cartilage, it's bathed in synovial fluid, and it has poor vascularity. So something that I, that, uh, a study that I think did contribute to how we think about um, these injuries and how we talk to our patients was this, um, this article showing that the biomechanical stability of a scaphoid fracture with a central screw and 50% uh, healing essentially has the same biomechanical uh, properties as an intact scaphoid. So this at least gives us uh, something that we can tell our patients um, uh, about when to return to, to their sport. Now, um, just like any treatment, you know, the sur surgery does have complications, the main of which that are, are seen clinically and tested is generally uh, related to screw uh, penetration. Um, obviously, you have risk of non-union infection, um, and obviously, this this screw on the bottom left um, wasn't ex didn't exactly achieve the goals of the surgery. So, lots of different uh, techniques. Um, we'll go through them uh, briefly. So, this was a, a percutaneous patient, uh, a percutaneous screw. Uh, I prefer, if possible, to go uh, retrograde just because I can um, extend the wrist, which helps with the reduction uh, maneuver. This is, uh, I'm using an osteotome here to remove the volar lip of the trapezium just to get a better uh, entrance point into the, the center center aspect of the scaphoid. Here's the guide wire and essentially straightforward. Um, this is the screw after we're done. Okay, here's another, another patient that, um, I'm sorry that the images are a little grainy, but I highlighted the fracture here. So it's kind of proximal third. And um, in the more proximal fractures, I do tend to go dorsal to get better trajectory of the screw and compression of the fragment. Um, so this is just the, the surgical approach, um, a dorsal longitudinal incision, opening up the third compartment and retracting the EPL um, and entering the, the capsule. Um, this is just a little uh, technical point about a derotational wire that can, that can help you with your trajectory as well as to prevent any displacement intraoperatively. Um, as well as uh, some, some people do use traction on the thumb to help. I don't typically do this, um, but, and, and then you can see using, um, using your, your K wires as joysticks to get your reduction. And now this image on the upper right is a semi supinated view. And you can see um, that this, this image is good to see a uh, dorsal screw penetration. For volar, uh, for volar approach to, uh, to the scaphoid, um, this is uh, generally helpful to correct humpback deformity because you can insert your graft if needed uh, volarly to, uh, to restore the, the alignment and therefore the uh, alignment between the proximal and distal rows. Some other fixation options. Um, the uh, multiple screw fixation, I think, has has an important role. And um, Dr. Kim, who's on this panel, I think contributed nicely to this, um, as well as volar plating, um, which I think is a viable viable alternative. I think the the jury is still out on indications, and I think that most of the trouble thus far has been to um, prominence of the of the hardware interfering with radiocarpal motion. And this is just an image showing sort of a watershed line um, that you uh, need to be careful about when placing your plate volarly. And just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through scaphoid non-unions um, uh, too much. However, I'll just uh, touch on it a little bit. This was a patient who um, fell and um, basically, uh, he wore his cast when he wanted to and came back six months later, essentially with a non-union. And this was, uh, this was the technique that I used. 
um, to correct the alignment of the scaphoid and therefore um, trying to get this bone to heal in the right position to restore alignment of the, uh, of the scaphoid and the rose. So in summary, you know, I, hopefully I confused you more than when we started. Um, some of my mentors have told me that's the goal of a good education is to confuse you more. But essentially for non-displaced waist fractures, um, I generally treat this non-op unless there's a good reason to do surgery. Um, and then the type of immobilization I use is a short arm thumb spica for six to 12 weeks, depending on fracture location. And I typically get a CT around three months to determine union or return to sport. In displaced fractures, uh, I tend to fix using a single uh, cannulated headless compression screw. Um, and I, I prefer antegrade for the more proximal fractures and otherwise um, I prefer the retrograde technique. In summary, you know, there's no real true consensus um, and most of these heal without surgery, but it's important to individualize treatment um, when taking care of these patients. Thank you. And I'll pass off to Dr. Strouch. Thank you, thank you. Let me get this uh, presentation done. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see that. We're going to talk about um, distal radius fractures. This was a true case. This was one of our senior residents in general surgery who was playing soccer. This was quite a while ago. He fell uh, down in Central Park and they, he was with our ortho residents. So they brought him into the ER and he had this uh, Collie's comminuted type of fracture. So question is, what do we do? You know, this is one of our senior residents at Columbia, do we take him to the OR right away and fix it or do a closed reduction? So his fellow residents did a nice closed reduction and the right side is the broken side, left side is comparison. Looks, looks pretty similar, maybe a tiny bit short. Lateral film looks quite similar. So now the question is, what do we do? You know, he comes to see me in my office a few days later. Is the reduction adequate? I would say yes. Will it hold? Well, that's what we need to discuss. And does he need to be fixed? We'll discuss that as well. So he ended up non-operative treatment and uh, he did quite well. And uh, although he was a little bit short, no symptoms, and he's currently the chief of cardiothoracic surgery. So he did quite well. So when we talk about distal radius fractures, you can basically fix all of them, even minimally displaced ones, which, which um, is an option. Or if you get a good reduction with a non-Barton shear type fracture, you could watch it. And if it makes it three and a half, four weeks, usually it'll be okay. And then you fix the ones that don't stay. So distal radius fractures are about 10% of all fractures, the most common fracture of the upper extremity, most common in young and older people. The normal anatomy, the AP film shows a radial inclination angle of 23 degrees and ulnar variance of about neutral with some variation, of course. The lateral film normally shows a palmar tilt of about 10 to 12 degrees. But you always want to x-ray the opposite wrist for comparison, because some people may be extremely ulnar negative or ulnar positive, and you, uh, in trying to match a normal uh, wrist, may be making their wrist abnormal for them. The AOS reduction guidelines for distal radius fractures are less than 10 degrees of dorsal tilt, less than 10 degree loss of radial inclination, which means it'll take it to about 13 or 15 degrees, less than three millimeters of shortening of the radius and an intraarticular step off less than two millimeters. Now, the AOS after reviewing many, many papers could not recommend for or against operative fixation if you were much younger than I am, which is 55. There's also no need for early wrist motion and that's key. You can lock up a wrist a long time and at a year out, the results are basically the same in terms of wrist motion 
as if you had started it moving immediately. On the other hand, finger motion needs to start right away because if you don't get the fingers moving, that will be a permanent limitation if they get stiff. We've all seen patients come back to the clinic six months later and you ask them to make a fist and all they do is make a fist 50% of the way. Also, no type of fixation has proven superior. So they can't make a case for molar plates versus X-fix versus anything else you might want to try. Now, what about older people in distal radius fractures? Well, yes, most of them have lower demands and comorbidities. And if they have arthritis, well, they may not have as long to suffer with it, right? But a lot of them are not accepting of a cosmetic deformity. We have a lot of 80-year-olds that are still playing singles tennis, and they have friends that may have a crooked wrist. They don't want their wrist to look like that. They want a straight wrist. So you really need to talk to them that if you choose non-operative treatment and it ends up with a malunion, that they're going to be okay with that. And sometimes they say they're going to be okay at the beginning, and then they're actually not okay with it. Abraham Collies in 1814 said that, yes, you're going to have some a deformity of the wrist, but it's going to be painless. Uh, so you don't really have to worry about it. And we know that's really not the case for many patients. This is a typical distal radius deformity with shortening, prominence of the ulna, and radial deviation. Now, uh, Dr. Paxima and Egal and co-authors uh, downtown did a nice study, distal radius fractures in the elderly, comparing operation versus non-op, and they found that the patients who were treated non-op were similar to those who had surgery, except their grip strength was better in the operative group at one year. This is a well-cited study by Aurora from Austria, where they did a prospective randomized trial comparing non-op with a volar, uh, non-op treatment compared to a volar locking plate, the patient 65 years and older, basically found no difference, although again, the grip strength was a little bit better in the operated group. This is a, a vast database study of over 13,000 patients comparing uh, outcomes and complications, and they found that stiffness was significantly more frequent following operative management compared to non-operative treatment. This is from Rochester, Minnesota in 2019, JBKS. So the real life problem is when a patient comes into your office, and the residents have done a great job, or the PAs in the ER, they did a great reduction. They did it twice, in fact, because they wanted to be perfect. And uh, it's okay. I mean, it looks all right, but we know that on the prior x-ray, before it was reduced, it, it looked pretty bad. So the dilemma is it may not hold, and over time, the fracture may settle and collapse. And I've been using this nice analogy for many years of the smashed styrofoam cup. So here we are about to fall on our outstretched hand, probably drunk if, if we uh, use Dr. Uh, Ayalon's patients, and, uh, and it smashes. And then you go to the ER and they pull it out to length. And it looks fairly okay. But if you look closely, you'll see on the AP here on the, ladder, on the, on the left and on the lateral X-ray, there's missing pieces of bone, okay? And if this is an old styrofoam cup with kind of crumbly styrofoam, the chances that this is not gonna hold are greater. And if there's more comminution or more missing pieces, the chances that it won't stay in place are greater. And so as time goes on and you make a fist and you compress the bone together, it's going to shorten a little bit until at the end, it may come back almost as bad as it was to begin with. That's why these fractures don't stay in certain cases. Now, there are some fractures that will never hold, like articular shear fractures, the volar and dorsal Barton's fracture that have a vertical fracture line. You can pull out. And that's great, but as soon as you let go, it slides back. Radial styloid fractures, same, same problem. So that's not gonna hold if you just pull out and, and try to put a splint on that or a cast. What else is unstable? If it's comminuted, if they're very crunchy fracturings, if it's old soft bone. So Lafontaine in 1989 wrote a small article that ended up being quoted quite widely. And they tried to find fractures that were gonna be unstable. And this was published in the Journal of Injury. So if there were three or more on the initial pre-reduction x-ray, initial dorsal tilt, significant, greater than 20 degrees, dorsal comminution, intraarticular fracture, ulnar fracture, ulnar styloid fracture, or if you were older than 60, if you had three or more, the fracture was most likely going to settle and collapse. So if you have a perfect reduction and it's not a Barton's type fracture, you have two options. You can either say, all right, well, it might hold, it might not hold, but we can see you every week and a half or so. And if it does collapse, we'll fix it. And if it makes it three to four weeks, it's usually gonna be okay. Or we can fix it just to ensure it stays in place. You don't have to worry about it coming. 
I don't have to worry about seeing you back and then having to squeeze you in the OR schedule. So there's two options and both are acceptable. So why fix a perfectly reduced fracture? Just for those reasons. Also the surgery is a little bit easier than if you get to it later and there's already a lot of callus forming and it's partially healed. Disadvantages of fixing things early obviously are the uh, disadvantages inherent with any surgery. What kind of surgery to do? Well, we used to do K wires and casting called pins and plaster, which not done so much anymore. External fixation used to be our go-to method back in the uh, 90s and the 2000s. Not done that much anymore. Plates, of course, that's our major go-to, volar locking plates predominantly, and combinations of the above. Now, plates and screws are mandatory for volar and dorsal articular shear fractures. Either a buttress plate or a locking plate is necessary. And of course, the volar locking plate is used for most types of fractures nowadays. What about the locking plate versus X-fix? Well, we did a study years ago showing that the uh, locking plate recovers motion faster because you're moving it faster. If you have an X-fix on for six weeks, you're not moving the wrist. So at six weeks, it's going to be very stiff <laughs> compared to if you get it moving at two weeks. But at a year, there was no difference in follow-up. And that was published in JBJS way back in 2009. Since then, there have been many studies showing that there's really no uh, preferred method of fixing radius fractures. Now, disadvantages of plates and screws, sometimes the screws end up in the joint. So it's very helpful to check a la uh, an angled lateral view to make sure that your screws are not in the joint. They can irritate the tendons, specifically the plates uh, with the volar plates with long screws can hit your EPL and rupture that and a prominent plate can rupture your FPL or the FVP of the index finger. Furthermore, the plate is not a panacea. It's not a guarantee of holding or healing the reduction. And so you have cases where things just don't work out as you thought. It's not a guarantee that everything's gonna be fine. The Soong index is something you should know about. And this is a measure of how prominent the volar plate is. We don't want it to be too prominent or it tends to rub on the FPL tendon in particular and may predispose to rupture. The more prominent it is, the more likely it is that the FPL may rupture. Here's one where you can see that screw sticking out, and this resulted in an FPL rupture. And if the F FPL does rupture, you can take a tenon graft and do an intercalary graft if it hasn't been too long. But if it's been a long time, there are other options such as tenon transfer or just fusing the thumb IP joint in some flexion. And here's the stump of the FPL that was eroded on the plate. So you have to take out the plate and hardware and do a reconstructive procedure. Now, EPL rupture is seen with dorsal screw penetration from a volar locking plate. There's no need to be bicortical with the distal row of screws. It's fine to go 75% of the way across. And you should know that the maximum screw length is about 18 millimeters. If you're putting in a 24 millimeter long screw and it's not, you know, shack, then it's, it's, it's too long. It shouldn't be longer than 18 millimeters long. You also see EPL ruptures with a non-displaced distal radius fracture. We're not sure how that happens, but it can happen a few months after treating a very minimal fracture, they'll show up with an EPL rupture. And uh, both of those can be treated with an EIP to EPL tendon transfer. And those usually do quite well. You have to make that pretty much as tight as you can do it because they always stretch out. So they ask about EPL rupture on exams. It's seen either with non-displaced fractures or with prominent volar to dorsal screws, you treat with an EIP to EPL transfer. The FPL ruptures on prominent volar hardware, and you treat that with an intercalary tenon graft or tenon transfer, usually of the FDS of the ring finger to the FPL, although you can also fuse the IP joint. Now, external fixation still has a role. It can maintain the length of the fracture and neutralizes your finger flexion forces, but usually it's used as a supplemental technique these days. Now, if you just pull straight out on the, on the hand, you're not going to restore your palmar tilt because your volar ligaments get tight before the dorsal ligaments. So as hard as you pull straight out, it's not going to restore palmar tilt. However, if you push the hand and including that with the lunate palmarly, that can actually translate the carpus and improve your palmar tilt of the radius. So here, no matter how much you distract it, you're only going to get to neutral tilt and maybe even not that. But if you push down on the hand and the carpus and translate the lunate palmarly, that will induce a force in the distal radius to try to make it a palmar tilt. Now, a lot of people's fingers get stiff with external fixation or any type of fixation or no fixation, just a, a splint. The reason is, is they didn't move their fingers. And that may be because the thing they had a splint on that was too long and they couldn't, 
or they didn't know to do it, or they were told over and over to do it, and they didn't do it because it hurt them too much, and they just didn't really want to hurt themselves. And that was me back in 1983 in medical school. I love to show this picture always in, in my distal radius thoughts because I actually had some hair back then. So anyway, it, I can tell you it is a little bit tricky to make a full fist with an external fixator on, but it's certainly doable, and it's not that hard. And uh, so it is possible to make a full fist with that easily. Now, external fixation I usually use for salvage uh, procedures now, such as when the volar lunate facet escapes around the plate and you have to redo the surgery, you can put an X-fix on to actually translate the hand dorsally, the opposite of what you would normally do for a, fixate, for a reduction and try to prevent resubluxations. Here was a case where the uh, volar lunate facet escaped around the plate and we redid the plate and put an X-fix on so I could sleep at night. And here we've translated the hand and the capitate dorsally, trying to pull the lunate dorsal so it doesn't exert a force to re-back out and re-translate. And you can see the capitate is riding a little bit dorsal here on the lunate, showing you that, that force that we put in before we locked in the X-fix. And that one stayed in place just fine. You can also put a dorsal spanning plate on, but the X-fix is only needed for four to six weeks and then everything's healed up. So I, I didn't think a spanning plate was necessary in this case. So a dorsal spanning plate is really an internal external fixator. A lot of people use it for many different indications, uh, and um, but it does need to be removed and there's sometimes tendon ruptures that can happen with it. And so I'll usually use it in a situation where I need to keep fixation solid for three months or more and then, and then take it out. And so here's a, a nasty radiocarpal fracture dislocation that occurred. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I'll use it in. What about fractures of the ulnar styloid? So a fracture at the base of the ulnar styloid, a big piece destabilizes the DRUJ because the TFCC attaches to the foveal area and is the main stabilizer of the DRUJ. So if you have this big chunk, the whole TFCC is attached to this piece. And yet, after you fix the radius, most of these are still associated with a stable DRUJ, surprisingly. So what you need to do is when you fix the radius, then you assess the stability of the DRUJ by trying to shuck it in and out. Most of the time it's stable, you don't have to fix the ulna, but if it's unstable, then you can fix that ulnar styloid with a small incision. There's many ways to fix it. I usually use a uh, K wire and then drill a hole through here and wrap a figure of eight uh, fiber wire type around that uh, pin and, and that works okay. One of the reasons why the, the DRUJ may be stable, even with no TFCC holding it, such as with that ulnar styloid base fracture, is that there's this thing called the distal oblique bundle of the interosseous membrane. And that is tension when the radius is brought out to normal length. And that may stabilize the distal ulna, even in the absence of a competent TFCC. A few other points. First of all, people, I don't care what kind of fracture you have, non-displaced, minimally displaced, major problem, it's very hard to do push-ups in the usual way or the yoga downward facing dog after a broken wrist. And so for a long time, if you like push-ups, do them on your knuckles, but I would recommend using a pad and not doing them directly on a hardwood floor like that. Second thing is it often, it took me six months to be able to get full supination back. And so I tell patients if they're, if they're struggling uh, at six weeks, not getting full supination, don't sweat it because eventually if you keep working at it, assuming that the bony anatomy is relatively okay, it should come back, usually. And it always hurts pretty much on the owner's side of the, uh, owner's side of the wrist when you're uh, deviating and maximum supination and pronation hurts for quite a long time because basically all these displaced fractures are associated with a TFCC tear, even if there is no ulnar styloid fracture. They also ask about vitamin C. There were some studies showing vitamin C, 500 a day prevents CRPS, that's largely been debunked, but sometimes they ask about that. Routine hand therapy, meaning for like every person that has a wrist fracture is not necessary, but it is mandatory if their fingers are not moving 100%, I think, right away. If they don't have 100% motion of their fingers right away, I send them the therapy for finger motion. And it's also helpful to check and send them for osteoporosis, for bone density testing, because this is the harbinger of worse fractures to come in older people. Questions that are associated with distal radius fractures on the in-service, they like to ask about this. What happened here? And this is volar subluxation of the carpus after fixing a radius with a plate. 
And the answer is the plate did not adequately capture the volar lunate facet of the radius. Here's a question. This is a 50 year old man who sustained a wrist injury after a motorcycle accident. There is no DRUJ instability after radius fixation. Management should include fixation of the radius. Okay, you see that there's a, a poly's fracture and there is a, a reasonable ulnar styloid fracture. So should you fix the radius alone? Should you excise the ulnar styloid, repair the TFCC, percutaneous fix the ulnar styloid, or do ORIF of the ulnar styloid? And the answer is that the, the stem is that there's no DRUJ instability. So stop, it's stable, that's it. Don't, don't do anything else. This is a CT scan of a 45-year-old woman who injured her wrist after a fall. Appropriate treatment of the fracture should include, cast immobilization is not gonna do it, closed reduction for cutaneous pin fixation, not gonna do it, ORIF and volar lock plating. Well, that's sort of appropriate, you would think. ORIF and radial styloid column plating, no, this is on the uh, ulnar side of the radius, or ORIF and fixation of the volar fracture fragment. Now that's a better answer because that's really what you want to do. You don't really need a volar plate for this. The volar plate's going to be over here. It's not going to capture that piece. But this isn't really a great question because there are some volar locking plates, of course, that will capture this. But the best answer is ORIF and fixation of the volar fracture fragment. 42-year-old woman is treated with a cast for minimally displaced disc radius fracture. So you're already thinking they may have ruptured their EPL sustained three months ago, develops a sudden inability to extend the thumb IP joint. How are we gonna treat it? Well, you can fuse the IP joint. That's, a, that's an acceptable answer, but it's only been three months. So it's, it's, um, it's reasonable, she's young. Uh, so it's reasonable not to do that as a first step. Evaluation for PIN palsy, that's unlikely if it's only a uh, EPL uh, problem. Primary repair of EPL tendon, usually not possible because these usually kind of rupture and the ends are, MOP ends, and, and they're not fixable primarily. So the answer is for EIP to EPL tendon transfer. Fixation failure of which comminuted disc radius fracture fragment is associated with volar subluxation of the carpus? And the answer here, as we've talked about, is the volar ulnar side. Which factor is a validated predictor of fracture displacement following closed reduction of a disc radius fracture? Age, gender, radial inclination, sh short arm cast. The answer is usually older people have worse bone and they tend to fall out of place. While attempting to recreate the inclination of a distal radius during volar fixation of an intraarticular fracture, use of fluoroimaging in this position would be helpful in showing, and they're showing you an angled view where you're going to be able to see down the slope of the radius. Remember, the AP film of the radius has a 23 degree angle, right? So if you bring it this way, you'll be able to see down the slope of the radius, and you'll be able to better see any screws that might be intraarticular, which is the answer. 35-year-old man has a markedly displaced radius fracture, has closed reduction. It looks good in a sugar tongue splint with the wrist in five degrees, so not much flexion. You know, we don't want to put the wrist in a lot of flexion for our splints. 18 hours later, he comes back to the ER with pain and numbness. He can't feel anything and the forearm is soft, minimally swollen and tender. So what's the next best step? So now he's got severe carpal tunnel syndrome pretty quickly after your reduction maneuver, which was not excessively flex. So you're not gonna, an answer of just redoing the uh, fracture position is not gonna be the correct answer. You wanna admit and observe, that's not gonna do anything. Fracture repair and carpal tunnel release, that makes sense. Fracture repair and fasciotomy doesn't make sense. His forearm compartments are soft. But you want to change the sugar tongue and put them into extension, and that's not going to do anything either because he really wasn't flexed significantly. So the answer here is fracture repair and carpal tunnel release. For enclosed reduction of a colleague's fracture, which maneuver in addition to traction will likely provide the best reduction? And we talked about this. This is volar translation of the lunate by trying to press down on the uh, metacarpals, basically, or the, or the dorsal carpus. Figures one and two show a volar plating eight months prior. Patient cannot actively extend her thumb for two days. You can see this screw is a little bit prominent here. And what's the best treatment? Answer, EIP to EPL tendon transfer. Removal of the hardware and EIP to EPL transfer. You got to remove the hardware. Otherwise, it's going to rupture your other extensor tendons. And here's the last one, I think. 82-year-old woman with osteoporosis. Eight weeks ago, she fell and treated herself with a removable wrist splint. 
She has no pain. She can dress herself. She prepares meals. She does everything without problems, but she has an obvious wrist deformity and only 70 degrees of wrist extension, which is actually better than me. And that's because it's, <laughs> it's dorsally tilted. She can make a full fist and she can fully move all her digits. What's the best treatment? Well, you could do a radius osteotomy, but you'd be treating the x-ray. And if it didn't work out well, she would be very unhappy with you because she can do everything that she wants. And she's 82. So the answer is to observe it. Thank you very much. And now we will introduce Scott Wolf, who is a man that, who needs no introduction from the Hospital for Special Surgery. And um, he is an international expert on wrist instability, a, a very difficult topic, which I'm sure he will make easy to understand. Thanks, Rob. Let's just uh, share my screen here. Can you see that, Rob? You good to go? Uh, no, I'm, we're not seeing your screen. Let's see you. Um, how about now? It's starting. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you. And uh, uh, good morning to everyone in this group. Uh, over the next 20 minutes, I'll, I'll blur through a whole bunch of concepts in carpal instability. While I have uh, several corporate consulting agreements, none will have any bearing on my thoughts on carpal instability. And over these 20 minutes, I'll try to shed some light on what's old, what's new, and what remains a total mystery to those of us in this arena. <clears throat> Scott, sorry to interrupt. Your, we can't fully see your slides. The left side is cut off. Mm, I don't know what to do about that. Oh, now I can. I'm sorry. Okay. Can everybody see okay? Okay. Just go oh, on. Can you see? You're not seeing my split screen. You're seeing the wrist and no, no. right? No, yes. With, with the definition? Correct. Okay. Per no. Perhaps it's being broadcast over my wrong, the wrong camera, but anyway, okay. Is that better? See everything? Yes. All right. So to begin, we need to agree on a definition of the sometimes confusing term wrist instability. Sanj Kakar and I agree that wrist instability is a symptomatic condition involving abnormal carpal bone motion during loading activities of the wrist. All of those elements are important. I mean, as we all know, we've seen wrists out of position that aren't even symptomatic. So it has to be symptomatic, it has to be during loading uh, and activity. And let's pique your interest by starting off with an OITE question. This 27-year-old female presents with these radiographs eight weeks after open reduction internal fixation of a scapoid fracture. You suspect which type of carpal instability? Give you a few seconds to read the answers. And think about this over the next uh, 15 minutes um, because the answer will be there. So understanding the three bones of the proximal carpal row and their ligamentous connections is vital to understanding carpal pathology. These three are the only truly mobile bones of the carpus as the distal carpal row is rigidly fixed to the hand and the forearm is the remainder. They're inherently unstable and they're guided by their articulations proximally and distally and the ligamentous constraints within. Over the past hundred years, two main theories of carpal bone kinematics have evolved to describe the wrist as organized into proximal and distal rows or as three linear columns. Both of these theories arose predominantly from two-dimensional radiographic studies of planar motion, that is flexion extension and radial ulnar deviation. Because of the complex three-dimensional motion of the carpus and the coupled or dart throwing motions required for most activities, many investigators have concluded that both theories are too simplistic to adequately describe carpal kinematics during wrist function and that functional risk kinematics requires combinations of both. <clears throat> what is the intercalated segment? Landsmere's eloquent 1961 paper furthered the idea of an inherently unstable link by describing the intercalated bone as one whose motions are entirely governed by its neighboring segments, like the segments of a wooden snake. His work was illustrated by the stacked phalanges of our digits and can equally well be visualized in the central column of the wrist. Linscheid and Dobbins expanded Landsmere's concept of the intercalated bone in this 1972 landmark article by including the neighboring triquetrum as an intercalated segment rather than intercalated bone, at once rigidly connected but inherently unstable. 
This concept furthered the now widely accepted carpal row theory of kinematics that was actually proposed by Disto nearly half a century earlier. There are no tendon insertions on the intercalated segment, thus its motion is entirely dependent on mechanical signals from the distal carpal row. As the hand unit moves, it follows passively. All bones of the proximal carpal row move together, albeit to different degrees, and limited by a set of surrounding ligaments. The scaphoid coordinates its motions through the tight interosseous scapholinate ligament. <clears throat> Critical to an understanding of the kinematics of the carpus is an understanding of the ligaments of the proximal carpal row, as all instability patterns are manifested as abnormalities of proximal carpal row motion. As Dick Berger demonstrated 20 years ago, the scaphoid and lunate are the key players of the proximal carpal row and are linked together by a complex scaphoid interosseous ligament made up of three component parts, of which the dorsal is the strongest. The ligament is vulnerable to injury with a fall in the outstretched wrist, which can tear all or part of this important structure. It should be thought of as the ACL of the wrist. The so called secondary volar supporting ligaments of the scaphoid and proximal carpal row include the radioscapal capitate the long, radio, long and short radiolunate ligaments, and the STT ligamentous complex. <clears throat> the tight envelope of the scaphoid's interosseous, volar intrinsic, and volar extrinsic ligament support system is demonstrated here. The dorsal intrinsic and extrinsic ligaments are equally important counterbalances to the volar ligament complex and include the important dorsal radiocarpal and the dorsal intercarpal ligaments. Steve Vegas emphasized the clever oblique orientation of these ligaments, which, like an accordion, expand and contract with rotations of the wrist. In addition, Berger and Doyle described the dorsal scapotraquetral ligament, the exact location or function of which was never really clarified. In this drawing, the DST is incorrectly portrayed proximal to the DIC. We feel that this critically important structure has been largely overlooked during the past two decades. We refer to these three ligaments collectively as the dorsal ligament complex. This shotgun exposure of a human wrist demonstrates these relationships and the unique labral-like arch that the dorsal scapotraquetral ligament creates for the nearly acetabular receptacle of the midcarpal joint. In this inset, <clears throat> viewing the dorsal wrist axially, the DIC can be lifted to demonstrate the deeper and very stout dorsal scapotraquetral ligament inserting on the distal waist of the scaphoid. Lauren Wessel spent the better part of her residency characterizing the anatomic and histological attributes of this seemingly important ligament by doing dozens and dozens of cadaveric dissections. <clears throat> we'll now try to explain the maze of ligament instabilities with a somewhat simplified and logical classification system. Weber's work was instrumental in understanding how the mechanical signals from the distal row regulate the motion of the proximal row. With all ligaments intact, the lunate is delicately balanced by competing flexion extension forces on either side. In our first fully segmented video of, the live human, of a live human wrist in 1998, we can see the uninjured proximal carpal row moves as a unit in both flexion extension and radial arm deviation, guided by the scaphoid. But Guilford had recognized decades, decades earlier that detached from the scaphoid, the central column was stable only in traction. The scaphoid link was thus critical to prevent collapse under load. This later illustrated that concept with the effect of waist fractures of the scaphoid. Intact, the proximal carpal row and the central column of the wrist are in kinematic balance. With disruption of the scaphoid lunate ligament or the scaphoid waist, the scaphoid is separated from the proximal row, initiating the slide into the first major class of carpal instability, so called dissociative carpal instability, and the inexorable slide into rotational instability, postural changes in the scaphoid, postural changes of the lunate and the attached triquetrum, or DZ, dorsal intercalated segment instability and ultimately degeneration and slack arthritis. <clears throat> Unlike slack wrist, ligament attenuation or rupture is not necessary for the development of the humpback scapegoat and DZ of snack wrist, scapegoat non-union advance collapse. As Watson described this 30 years ago, the predictable and relentless pattern of degenerative arthritis ensues, generally sparing the proximal scapegoat and the lunate. The best defense against SNAC is to prevent it by early surgery on scaphoid non-unions. <clears throat> a similar situation can occur with traumatic disruptions on the ulnar side of the wrist. With disruption of the lunar trochlear ligament, scaphoid and luminate eventually tip into flexion, or VZ, so-called volar intercalated segment instability. 
Thus, two major classes of carpal instability can be defined by the site of ligament injury, either within the proximal carpal row or between the rows. Non-dissociative instabilities are more difficult to understand and reproduce. Carpal instability non-dissociative is defined by the Wrist Investigators Workshop is a general class of carpal instability. It does not involve a break in the proximal or the distal row, it involves ligaments spanning the radiocarpal and the midcarpal joints, and might better be termed proximal carpal row instability because, again, the only bones of the carpus that move are the proximal carpal row. It has multiple etiologies. Most often, SIN presents in individuals with ligament laxity, and a snapping or clunking proximal row is demonstrated by the midcarpal shift maneuver on the right. <clears throat> In this article by Allison Kate, we provided a framework for classifying SIN, including the broadly used misnomer midcarpal instability, sorry, David Lickman, as the largest group. The clip dorsal variety is described by Dean Lewis 40 years ago. The rare combined SIN as seen in young kids and systemically lax individuals, and the common adapted deformities as seen in distal radius fractures or mad lungs deformity. The common denominator of all of these is that the entire proximal row not just the midcarpal joint, moves abnormally as a unit without a break in the proximal row. To these four, it's become apparent there's a fifth variety of sin that occurs following trauma, including both distal radius fractures and scapegoid fractures. In a collaborative study with Mark Ross and Greg Cousins from Australia, we've identified eight cases of post-traumatic non-dissociative DZ and VZ with confirmed intact scapulonate lunotroquetral ligaments an MRI or arthroscopy that confirmed the identity of the ruptured extrinsic ligaments that enabled the lunate postural change. Like boats in a harbor, which need both bow and stern mooring lines for a hurricane-like Ian, the lunate has flexible dorsal and palmar tethers that stabilize it through an incredible range of motion and applied loans. Disruption of one or both of the volar dorsal combinations allows the lunate to tip in a reciprocal fashion with the rest of the proximal carpal row. Disruption of the opposite combination allows the lunate in the proximal row to tip into VZ. The third and final class, carpal instability complex, doesn't fit into a tight scheme, but rather represents different combinations of ligament and bony injuries. Transverse carpal instability or translation, translational deformities of the carpus, most usually ulnar translation deformity, or massive injuries to uh, the extrinsic ligaments of the proximal limb across the proximal row. Combined injuries can be illustrated by perilunate or lunate dislocations. And longitudinal or nasty injuries, so, somewhat like this frank fractures of the foot that divide the carpus in half along the lines of the metacarpal. They usually include nerve injuries and, and vascular injuries and can be very serious. So when faced with radiographs like this, there's almost, and pardon the pun, a dizzying array of repairs available to treat scapulonate ligament injury. What's important to understand is that despite dozens of creative surgical techniques over decades, there's frustratingly little evidence that we've moved our overall success rate forward, no single repair that provides uniform success, and no consensus or guidelines available to help us choose amongst them. So what initiates the degenerative change of slack arthritis and how can we prevent it? <clears throat> is it rotary subluxation of the scaphoid? Is it gap or diastasis? Or is it DZ? You're right, it's scaphoid tra dorsal translation. In two recent studies, we've demonstrated statistical association between scapulonate ligament rupture and translation of the scaphoid onto the dorsal rim of the radius. With that, the midcarpal joint is disrupted, breaking that acetabular com container of the capitate and allowing it to drift dorsally. Its mo dorsal moment accentuates the tendency of the detached intercalated segment to just tilt dorsally, and the scaphoid's dorsal rim position leads to rapid cartilage loss. We thus question Watson's nested spoons analogy and propose instead that the scaphoid, that symptomatic patients have more than uh, rotational instability of the scaphoid. In fact, dorsal scaphoid translation is very easily detected on true lateral radiographs in relationship to a line through the dorsal rim of the scaphoid facet. It's also the only radiographic parameter that correlates with patients' pain following scapulonate ligament repair or reconstruction. The articular surface of the distal row is at once elliptical in the coronal plane and spherical in the sagittal plane because of its obliquity to the acetabular receptacle of the proximal carpal row. This is magnificently illustrated by a Shao-Moritomo schematic of the oblique axis of the midcarpal joint. Unlike the orthogonal and arbitrary planes of flexion extension and radial radiation, the midcarpal joint enables the coupled motions of radial extension to ulnar flexion, 
or the so-called dark doors plane of motion. In 2005, we demonstrated that the proximal row was nearly still during this important arc of motion. Work at our institution and many others demonstrated that nearly all complex motions of household, occupational, and recreational activities occur predominantly through the mid-carpal joint. Through collaborative work with anthropologists Mary Marsky and colleagues at Arizona State University, we proposed that the dark doors motion was unique to humans and may have conferred a survival advantage to early hominids during the transition from tree-dwelling herbivores to ground-dwelling omnivores. Further anatomic study on cadaveric wrist demonstrated that the physiologic axis of wrist motion lies not in the anatomic planes of flexion extension and radial ulnar deviation, but rather in an oblique plane from radial extension to ulnar flexion or dart throwing. So our primary goal of scapho ligament repair and reconstruction is to restore mid-carpal architecture and function. And that's evidenced by the containment of the mid-carpal joint by reuniting the proximal carpal row and most importantly, eliminating dorsal scapoid translation. So why can't we get this right? We continue to struggle with our outcomes of scapulant repair and reconstruction as Julie Adams and colleagues illustrated in this review of 82 wrists followed uh, uh, retrospectively. They showed in this paper, there was a 20% failure of ligament repairs and reconstructions at six months, and that at six weeks, a TLT or a triligament tendinitis was equally effective to a primary repair, that the primary repairs after six weeks, at least in their hands, did not work. So how can we improve the treatment of scapulant instability? We need to understand its etiology. It's been taught to us by Short, Palmer, and, and many other investigators that the primary problem is the loss of the joint couple as evidenced by diastasis of the scapulinate joint and failure of the scapulinate ligament, followed by secondary rupture or attenuations of the secondary, so-called secondary restraints. But which ones? The ST, are they STT ligaments, the volar capsular ligaments, the dorsal ligament complex? We really didn't know. Um, a 2019 cadaveric study by Alfonso Perez from Chile and our lab demonstrated that scapulonate injuries alone do not cause DZ, that division of the long radial lunate, the SDT, or the DIC lunate attachments cause statistical increases in radial lunate angle, but that DZ was created only when the SDT or the complete DIC were divided in addition to the scapulonate osseous ligament. We now refer to the SDT, the long radial lunate, and the dorsal intercarpal ligament as critical stabilizers of the carpus rather than secondary stabilizers. I don't have enough time to elaborate on the effects of ligament section on gap, scapulonate angle, and dorsal translation, but what seems to be becoming apparent is that the various postural abnormalities of the carpus may be dependent on injury to different critical stabilizers. As we continue the search for the ideal scapulonate repair, we should consider gaining a detailed inventory of injury to additional critical stabilizers using either MRI or arthroscopy and customizing our repairs accordingly. With so many creative repairs from so many uh, in so many different institutions and in different classes, we should start to consider an individualized approach rather than the traditional one-size-fits-all approach to dissociative carpal instability. Have we been concentrating on the wrong parameter of scapular limb dissociation all along? It's more than a gap. <clears throat> from Adelaide, Australia, Michael Sandow's novel reconstruction addresses not only the gap but reconstructions each of the critical ligaments of the carpus. The technique uses a three centimeter flex carpal radialis tendon graft based distally and reinforces it with a two millimeter synthetic tape. Each pass is anchored after tensioning to avoid stress relaxation. I've now switched to this technique for most of my difficult reconstructions with DZ and, and DST and have a successful cohort of 20 cases that we just reported on in Boston. Our video of the technique is available on ViewMedi, HSS video and the, video, H, and the ASSH video library and YouTube under uh, NFM. It may be time to retool our diagnosis and treatment of scapegoat instability. Diagnosis should include an inventory of all uh, injured structures using arthroscopy and or high resolution MRI followed by staging and targeted treatments of the particular injured ligaments. So now it's time to test your recall. Which is it? Correct. This is non-dissociative DZ. I'd like to thank you for your attention. That was a lot of information. I'm available to answer questions. Uh, many thanks to the literally dozens of my colleagues at HSS and around the globe who've uh, contributed to all of this and to helping me understand uh, this uh, most fascinating topic. Thank you very much.
Next, we have Dr. Martin Posner. So Richard, um, okay, he's ready, great. I was gonna say I'm available for questions. I probably finished a little bit early. Can you see my slide? We can see you, but we can't see your slide. Huh. Mm. The share screen on the lower bottom, the green. Um, let me go out of this then. Uh, let's see. You bring your pointer down to the lower column. You should be able to see share screen in green. No, I don't see it. What do you think? Okay, we're starting to see it. Do you see it now? We see it now, correct. Thank you. Let me go back. <coughs> So I want to talk about the extensive tendon mechanism and anatomy and pathology. Uh, and I'm going to cover the anatomy, the intrinsic paralysis. Uh, Dr. Dillon's did a wonderful job on describing the mallet finger. Uh, and I'll briefly discuss that together with swan neck deformities and then with the boutonniere deformity. So the extensive tendon mechanism receives contributions from both extrinsic and intrinsics. If we just look at the contribution of the extrinsics on a finger, the primary extensors of the MP joints are the EDC, and for the index and little fingers, as you know, there's a proprius tendon as well. Those are the primary extensors. And the primary flexors are the FDS and FDP. So when the extrinsics contract with no other force acting on the finger, the result is uh, clawing. Uh, clawing is commonly referred to as the intrinsic minus hand because there's no effect of the intrinsic muscles. The pathology is always neurogenic, whether it's an injury or a neuropathy. Uh, and there can be clawing of all the fingers due to uh, median and ulnar nerve pathology, which is common. Remember that the ulnar nerve can innervate all the intrinsics by a nerve connection uh, in the palm called the rush kadu connection. Uh, it's a connection and not an asthmosis since nerves don't have stomas. Uh, clawing requires a functioning profundi, and that's why clawing is much worse with a low ulnar nerve lesion than a high injury. And it also requires supple joints, uh, meaning that MP joints that passively hyperextend. In those individuals who are tight jointed and have little or, or, or no uh, passive extension of their MP joints, there's little or no clawing. So if this are the extrinsic effects on a finger, what's missing? We need something that is the primary flexor of the MP joint, and those are the intrinsics. And we need extensors of the interphalangeal joints. Uh, the intrinsics are not the primary extensors because the extrinsics also have a role. Normally, our MP and IP joints flex together. Without the intrinsics, there is no primary flexor of the MP joints. Therefore, the MP joints can only flex after the IP joints, and the fingers actually roll into the palm, and that obviously interferes with grasping larger objects. Uh, the intrinsic linkage <laughs> between the flexors and extensors uh, the lateral bands pass volar to the MP joints and dorsal to the interphalangeal joints. With only intrinsic function, there's MP flexion and IP extension. And this is a patient who had a Volkmann's ischemic contracture of the intrinsic muscles. He was a hemophilic who had a compartment syndrome of his hand for which treatment was uh, delayed. Uh, and this is commonly referred to as the intrinsic plus hand. Remember, the intrinsics extend the interphalangeal joints, and the extrinsics also extend them via the central tendons, often called the central slips. 
The extrinsic contribution to uh, finger extension is via the sagittal fibers and central tendons. And the intrinsic contribution is via the transverse and oblique fibers and the lateral bands. So there are sagittal fibers and transverse fibers. They're contiguous with each other, but have very different functions. The sagittal fibers are part of the extrinsics and they go volar, exert on the volar plate and extend the MP joints. And the transverse fibers are part of the intrinsics and they flex the MP joints. So the extrinsics are the primary extensor of the MP joints and their primary flexors of the PIP and DIP joints. The intrinsics are the primary flexors of the MP joints, and they also extend the interphalangeal joints. However, the extrinsics can also extend those joints, provided they don't hyperextend the MP joints. So a favorite question I have for the residents is, what extends the interphalangeal joints? And typically the answer is the intrinsics. Uh, it's also the extrinsics, but you have to add the word provided, provided they don't hyperextend the MP joints. The orientation of the sagittal fibers varies with positions of the MP joints. With the MP extension to neutral position, the fibers are perpendicular to the axis of the MP joint. In hyperextension of the MP joint, those fibers are almost horizontal, and the extension force is only at the MP joints. In that position, the central tendon is lax, and there can't be any active extension of the PIP joints. With MP flexion, the sagittal fibers are oblique and distal to the axis of the MP joint, and the extrinsic EDC, together with the EIP and EDQP of index and little fingers respective, respectively, can pull through to the central tendon and therefore achieve PIP extension via the extrinsics. Intrinsic paralysis, or the intrinsic minus hand, the most predictable treatment depends on an important clinical test. It's with blocking of MP extension permits the extrinsic extensors to pull through to the central tendons and extend the interphalangeal joints. It's referred to as the Bouvier maneuver, named for a French orthopedic surgeon in 1851, who observed it in a patient with ulnar palsy. A favorite question I have is to what degree does MP extension have to be blocked for the extrinsics to pull through to the central tendons and achieve PIP extension? The answer is just enough. There is no specific degree. It could be as little as zero degrees or 10 degrees or it may be more. The Bouvier maneuver requires normal central tendons that are not attenuated. If they're slightly attenuated, MP extension has to be blocked to a greater degree. Now, blocking it up to 30 or 35 degrees is okay. But if the central tendons are severely attenuated and you have to block the MP joint to 45 degrees or more, to achieve extension, that's not okay. You're changing one problem for another problem, and now you're causing flexion contractures in the MP joints that could interfere with function. So chronic clawing leads to central tendon attenuation, and therefore, following an injury or a neuropathy, it's important not to ignore clawing. A worthwhile uh, splint to provide is referred to as a lumbrical bar splint, which simply blocks MP extension. And it blocks it to a point sufficiently to permit the extrinsic central tendons to extend the PIP joints. And the therapist makes this splint by just measuring with a goniometer 
at one point, MP extension has to be blocked. And you could see in this individual, it's really just blocking the hyperextension and you don't have to even put it into any flexion. For surgery for chronic clawing, when it's too late for a nerve repair or a nerve repair was unsuccessful in restoring intrinsic function, a very predictable operation is a volar capsulodesis of the MP joints originally described by Zancoli, which mimics the lumbrical bar split. So simply, the MP joints are flexed to positions that permit PIP extension via the extrinsics, determined by the Bouvier maneuver. And at surgery, the volar plate is advanced approximately into the metacarpal head. So here's an 18-year-old female with Charcot-Marie tooth disease who had severe clawing, and it only required blocking her MP extension slightly for her to actively extend her interphalangeal joints. Planning for a volar plate capsulodesis is not a difficult procedure. Based on the preoperative examination, we want to stabilize the MP joints, maybe a few degrees more than that test showed, uh, and with a goniometer during surgery, determine that degree and pin the MP joints in that flex position. The membranous portions of the plates are then elevated and sutured into necks, and suture anchors work just fine. So here's the preoperative picture and the postoperative picture, which looks pretty good. Remember, chronic clawing results in attenuation of central tendons. And when the, when the Bouvier maneuver requires the MP joint have to be blocked more than 40 or 45 degrees or even more, then the Zancoli procedure is not effective. It can be effective, but you're producing a, a flexion contracture of the MP joints, which is another problem. Uh, th this talk is in a very extended uh, version on the uh, ASH uh, hand site, and we'll discuss what you do if, if a, capsule, a Zancoli procedure would not be indicated, and I discuss intrinsic transfers, but I don't have time in this morning's lecture to do that. Uh, Dr. Nellens covered this, uh, procedure, uh, this injury very well of a mallet finger. And there are two mechanisms of injury, an axial force on the tip of the finger where you get flexion and you get injury to the terminal extensor tendon with or without an avulsion fracture, or it could also be due to DIP hyperextension where you get a, an impaction fracture at the base of the distal phalanx. There are a number of different classifications. Uh, I like the Tubiana classification of 1986 because it, it helps me in determining what to do. Uh, it, 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 type one is a tendon rupture, type two and three are fractures, avulsion fractures with or without subluxation. And as Dr. Nalens pointed out, it's not important to determine the size of the fracture fragment. Naturally, the bigger the fracture, the more likely the subluxation, but that's not always true. And type four is the epiphyseal plate fracture. For type one injuries, which are the most common, all you need to do is splint the DIP joint. It's unnecessary to split the PIP joint. Uh, and I would caution you to, not to use the froggy splints because they, they consist of, of uh, these aluminum tabs being pushed against the finger. And I've seen a number of patients with skin necrosis. The splint can be dorsal, volar, or a commercial splint like the stack splint, which is a combination of dorsal and volar. Uh, my preference, I like dorsal splits. They interfere less with use of the hand, and they're easy to change while maintaining extension of the joint. Naturally, when you want to change the splint or want to cleanse the dorsal from the skin, you can't allow the DIP joint to flex, otherwise you're starting from day one. With, the, with a bony avulsion fracture, the question is, is there subluxation or not? Uh, and if there is subluxation, then these should be treated, as Dr. Nalens pointed out. The swan neck deformity is a description, not a diagnosis, of PIP hyperextension and DIP flexion, which resembles the neck of a swan. It can be normal in some loose-jointed individuals who are able to contract their intrinsics without contracting their extrinsics. 
There are many etiologies of swan neck deformities. It could be due to intrinsic muscle contractures as in an inflammatory arthritis, a volar instability of a PIP joint, in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, in CP spasticity in the stroke hand, and other diagnoses as well. The diagnosis of just writing swan neck deformity does not provide any information as to etiology. So to use the deformity in a diagnosis, you should always add due to. For instance, you can say swan neck deformities due to intrinsic contractures or swan neck deformity due to uh, volar instability of the PIP joint. The boutonnier deformity, which it curiously is only referred to as a boutonnier deformity in English speaking countries, because in French speaking countries, it's referred to as deformité buttonhole. Don't ask me why that is. I've asked my French colleagues about that many times and I've never gotten an answer. So the radial and all the lateral bands become edges of a buttonhole. Normally with a PIP flex 90 degrees, we're unable to actively extend the DIP joint because the central tendon in the, in the PIP flexion of 90 degrees is pulled distally and the lateral bands are lax. And therefore with, with MP flexion, you can extend the DIP joints, but not just with PIP flexion. The Elson test is positive in an acute boutonniere. With PIP flexion, the DIP extends and it's due to the lateral bands pulled proximally and subluxated volar to, P to the PIP axis. I generally don't use the Elson test except when around the hand fellows, because I just want them to let them know that I know what it is. Classification of boutonniere deformities can be acute, subacute, and chronic. The acute boutonniere deformity is unfortunately often missed. Uh, there can be swelling and tenderness of the dorsum of the PIP joint, which can be the only clinical signs. And you need an index of suspicion when evaluating PIP injuries. If there's tenderness over the joint or slight swelling, you should treat it and splint the PIP joint in extension. What unfortunately happens is these Injuries are seen in an emergency room, the x-rays are normal, and the patient is, is told to at some point see their family doctor, and weeks later they show up with a severe and chronic boutonniere deformity. Active extension of the PIP joint can be complete or near, nearly complete when the injury is limited to the central tendon, meaning the triangular ligament is intact and the lateral bands have not shifted vola to the axis of motion. So if someone took an 11 scalpel blade and just cut the central tendon, you probably would not get a boutonniere deformity because the lateral bands would not shift. When in doubt, split the PIP joint in extension and reevaluate within a week. What's important is the retinacular ligament of which there are two components, a transverse component and an oblique component. With the PIP flex, the oblique retinacular ligament is in a relaxed position. And when something is in a relaxed position, either ligaments or tendons, they can undergo contractures. And the result is you not only get limited DIP flexion, but also wind up with an extension contracture of the DIP joint. Therefore, it's important to prevent contracture of the oblique retinacular ligament. Uh, Splint the PIP joint in full extension. Do not split the DIP joint. And the original splint was uh, made by Sterling Bunnell, and it was called a safety pin splint because he made it, made it out of a safety pin for a horse blanket. A more effective splint is made by a hand therapist, which immobilized the PIP joint, not the DIP joint, it's, and it's important that patients begin active and even passive DIP flexion. Surgery is generally unnecessary for the acute closed boutonniere deformity. And the only exception would be a central slip avulsion with a bony fragment, which is not very common. Uh, I will prefer to fix these with a intraosseous uh, wire that's passed under the lateral bands and through the middle phalanx. What's the difference between a boutonniere deformity and a pseudo-boutonniere deformity? They occur on different sides of the joint. A boutonniere deformity is an injury to the extensor tendon mechanism. 
the central tendon, and lateral bands, while a pseudoboutonuria deformity refers to a flexion contracture of the PIP joint. There's been no primary injury to the extensors. For the diagnosis, don't look at the PIP joint, but look at the DIP joint. When there's limited or no active flexion of the DIP joint, it's the patient has a contracture of the oblique retinacular ligament, which is very common in chronic glutenia deformities, and the patient is unable to flex the DIP joint. Here's a case of a pseudoboutonia deformity. There's severe uh, uh, lack of extension of the DIP joint. The patient has complete active flexion, but can can uh, but has a, but is unable to extend the PIP joint. Now, a pseudoboutonia deformity can become a true boutonniere when the central tendon attenuates, and that's likely to occur when the severe flexion retracture of the PIP joint, as in this patient who had a hyperextension injury to the PIP joint and tore the volar plate and it scarred down in this position. So a pseudoboutonier deformity can turn into a boutonier deformity. In subacute boutonniers, which occur about seven to 10 days post-injury, there's usually swelling of the joint, a loss of active extension, and passive PIP extension can also be restricted. Use an extension splint for five or six weeks. Start them on exercising immediately for the DIP joint. And this patient did well, <coughs> regained full PIP and DIP flexion, but had a slight loss of PIP extension, which wasn't severe enough to warrant surgery. When passive PIP uh, extension is restricted, you could use serial casts that are changed weekly, similarly to what you would do with a child with a club foot. And this patient had a, a total of six serial casts uh, and then had therapy and got a very good return of motion with only a slight deficit in PIP extension. A chronic boutonniere deformity, uh, the indications for surgery are you need supple, soft tissues, excellent passive mobility, and critically important, you need a cooperative patient. There are numerous surgical techniques that uh, have been uh, published, and they all involve relocating the lateral bands dorsal to the axis of motion of the PIP joint. Uh, I'm a firm a believer in operations to keep it simple. Use a curved incision over the PIP joint, better than a bayonet incision, because generally you don't want to make incisions where tendons will glide. And the apex of the uh, incision is at the mid-axial point on either side of the joint. You want to bring the lateral bands dorsal to the axis of motion. You want to suture them together, reforming the triangular ligament using one or two five oh or six oh nylons. And if possible, bring the central slip distal to the PIP joint. It's very important not to put sutures proximal to the PIP joint, because if you do that, you'll wind up with a very firm repair and the patient will never flex that PIP joint. A chronic stiff boutonnier deformity is one of the most difficult problems in hand surgery. It's actually two problems. It begins with the incompetent extensive mechanism, and then you have secondary PIP and DIP joint and a contracture of the oblique retinacular ligament. Do not try to reconstruct the extensor tendon when PIP and DIP joints are stiff. Doing capsulectomies and an extended extensor tendon reconstruction at the same operation will change a stiff flex finger into a stiff extended finger. The first objective is to try to treat the PIP and DIP joints non-operatively. Try to reduce the problem to just the extensor tendon injury using non-operative methods for the joint contractures. Dynamic splints are generally not effective because there's an insufficient extension force. Static progression, progressive extension splints exert more force, but usually not sufficient to have result in any improvement. And serial casts exert even greater force, and they can be effective if the joint stiffness is not rigid. When non-operative measures fail to restore passive joint motions, surgery can be considered, but it requires a two-stage procedure. You have to do capsulectomies of the PIP and DIP joints. You got to release the oblique retinacular ligament. And then stage two is reconstruct the central tendon. 
This requires an incredibly well-motivated patient who will exercise effectively to regain active flexion after stage one, and also to maintain passive PIP and DIP joints prior to stage two, and usually both flexion and extension dynamic and static progressive splints are required. Two-stage reconstructions are rarely indicated and rarely successful. I've done it only twice in my career with not the greatest results because the interval between stage one and stage two is easily six months or more, and the overall recovery is generally more than a year. Alternative procedure to a two-stage reconstruction is a PIP fusion. Thank you very much. I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Kim, who's going to talk about flexor tendon injuries. Thank you very much. Um, let me share the screen. And uh, I thank Dr. Gilbert for having me follow Dr. Posner after that talk. I don't know if you guys know, but that talk is a very famous talk that he gives almost uh, every every uh, uh, every one of these uh, meetings. Can always learn something from it every year. Let me see. Do you guys see my um, slides? Yes. And uh, you guys hear me? Okay, great. So <clears throat> hi, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I was asked to do a presentation on flexor tendon injuries. Uh, this is a well-discussed and well-studied topic due to the fact that it's a high yield question on self-assessment and OITE, but as you know, the ability to perform a flexor tendon repair is what one of the things that distinguishes a hand surgeon from other um, subspecialties. But I want to take a little bit different approach as, as opposed to coming from a student's perspective. I wanted to see uh, the surgeon's perspective on this. And, and, you know, I want to see what I, I want you guys to see what I see in the operating room and for residents and fellows, you can kind of learn from that. And then the, the attendings that are more senior than I am, you can kind of see what the junior guy is doing and maybe uh, help me out to become a better surgeon at repairing these. So let's just get uh, to the straight to the point. So this is a 25 year old female um, with a, a, a knife cut to the metal ring and small finger complete loss of tenodesis effect, and both FDS and FDP are out. This is an acute injury, um, and we're all surgeons, and we can make this better, so we're gonna operate, okay? And this is a good time to go into um, zone of injury. Let me just minimize this. Okay, great. So the zone one is distal to the FDS insertion, and this is the flexor tendon that has a, um, a separate classification, um, a separate classification for FDP uh, injuries called the Letty Packer classification. It goes from one to five. Um, it's 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 the type is a little bit weird. Type one is 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 actually worse than type two and three, and then type four and type five are also very difficult to fix. Basically, type one is where it retracts to the palm, and that's the one that you have to repair very quickly, where it ruptures from all the vascular channels. And, and goes through all this all the pulley sheath. Whereas type two and three are the ones that get stuck either at the uh, A4 pulley or at the, at the level of the PIP joint because it has a bone fragment attached to it. Um, type, the zone two is what we're all familiar with, right? It goes from the proximal A1 to FDS insertion. And this is what's known as the no man's land because it's prone to adhesions and re-ruptures and in the old days, they never used to fix these. Um, for the residents and fellows, please note that your A1 pulley is not at the digital palmar crease. It's actually at the, at the level of the palm over your digital palmar crease. So it's much more proximal than you think. Zone three is distal transverse copper ligament to proximal A1. This is where the, the lumbacals are. And if you read papers and textbooks and they say, hey, there's less scarring here, there's no sheath, it's an easier repair. Um, 
but I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go through that with you. And then zone four, as you know, it's carpal tunnel, you know, you have to worry about the median nerve. And then zone five is typically what we consider the spaghetti wrist um, with a suicide attempt. So zone three, I just want to quickly go over. Um, as you can see, this is a zone three injury, which in my opinion is not easy. Here's why. Um, it's at the level of the Palmer region, which we don't typically operate very often. And it houses the branching common digital nerves of the median and ulnar nerve. And it also has a um, superficial arch of the radial and ulnar um, arteries. These neurovascular structures are superficial to the to the to the tendon. So you have to dissect them out to get to where you need to go to repair these. So I think in, in my opinion, these are actually very difficult injuries to fix. And they do scar. I mean, you can see this big bulk of scar here on the palm. Um, so you can get significant amount of stiffness and adhesions. And when they move the finger, you can actually see the skin move with it. So this particular patient was very compliant and did well, but, but it's, not, it's not as easy as uh, they make it sound. So um, so let's go back to the first patient. Um, this is the zone two injury involving the three fingers. And this is after the repair. This is the intra assessment of the tendon excursion and repair integrity. Notice that there's no knot or suture impinging against the tendon sheath, and there's no gapping at the repair site, which is associated with higher failure rate. For residents and fellows, there are a lot of things you can learn from going into the OR. So pay attention to sort of everything you see here, okay? And this is just me moving the fingers back and forth after the repair. This is the still image of the same video, okay? Let's go through what I see, okay? The, the cut, knife cut, was at the level of the digital pulmonary crease, which is what typically happens with, typ uh, with a, like, a, like a cooking injury. The first arrow is where the cut was. The second uh, arrow is where the tendon is actually cut. Why is the tendon so much more distal than the site of trauma? Think about that for a second. If you want to be super slick, then you can estimate where the tendon cut is and minimize the length of the incision, hence less scarring. In some cases, you don't have to reopen the healed site to identify the both ends of the, of the tendon. When you're designing your incision though, you have to make sure that you can incorporate the injured site if needed if you're not reopening the, the cut site. This is what the junior residents see, right? I mean, when they, when they prepare for a case, um, they, 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 they look through and they worry about all these various type of core stitch. And they also think about epitendinous stitch, which, which are both important. And then they will go read about all sorts of cool repair techniques and then fundamentally understand that the number of core sutures traversing the cut site makes a difference in the strength of the repair. An excellent article by our, our NYU colleague summarized these repairs for you at, at, in their, their yellow journal in 2018. Um, the techniques are various techniques. There's Bonal techniques, Casper grasping techniques, Kessler Tajima technique. And my personal favorite is the, is the crucial repair but they're all some sort of variation of two to six uh, strand techniques. So here's, these are some of the concepts that have been kind of beaten down to us, right? You have the number of suture strands crossing the site, suture material, um, in, in uh, incorporating the locking configuration, and then you add the epitendin suture, which improves the strength by about 10 to 50%. But I want to focus on two additional concepts here, okay? That's perhaps less emphasized. The effect of the tension with a, um, 
uh, effective tension causes a shortening of the tendon and then a little clumping when you repair these. And when you, when you clump these by 10 to 20%, the, the, the amount of force that's required to gap the tendon when you start the range of motion goes, by, goes up by about 100%. So you have to shorten it just enough to increase the strength of the repair, but uh, not too much so that it actually causes an impingement of the sheath. When I used to do these um, flexor tendon repairs when I was first starting out, I clumped them and I never had any uh, re-ruptures. And then I thought I was getting really good. And then I started making them without any uh, clumping and made it like perfectly straight. You could barely see the, re the repair side. You could barely see the sutures. And I actually ended up starting to get ruptures on my flexor tendons. So then I went back to clumping and then um, uh, uh, I went back to clumping and, and, and the ruptures have not happened again. So this is one of those things, one of the biggest advantages of Wallon procedure is that you can actually see the gapping as they actively flex the fingers. I also wanna briefly mention, that's perhaps less emphasized in this paper is that, and I think it's equally important is that all mechanism of failure happens at the knot. And I emphasize this to the residents um, and most of them still ignore me anyway, but your knot has to be cinched down. You can put seven or eight knots there but if it's loose knots, they will unwind over time. And that's the side of failure. Um, and it is the weakest point of your repair. So don't blame the patient. You know, don't blame the tendon. It's not the suture material. It's your knot that's actually causing it to rupture. So let's go back to the, um, our, our repair here, as you can see. So we talked about the locking cushion and epitendinous stitch. The slight clumping of the tendon, which, which helps with the strength of the repair and prevents that two millimeter gapping, which is known to uh, cause higher failure rate. We also got to talk about um, the purchase length of the tendon, which one side here, I think it's about one centimeter. This side is probably about half of that. But it, you really want to grab that healthy tendon away from the repair site. Based on this particular study, If you, if you, um, if you uh, repair the with the with the grab of about four millimeters, it diminishes the the repair by about fifty percent. Sometimes it's a little somewhat limited by the curvature of your needle, but with practice, you can definitely grab it farther away from the from the from the cut site, which I think helps uh, dramatically with your strength of the repair. And then when you're thinking about where to place the knot, you wanna go away from the pulley sheath, whether it's distal or proximal, as you move the finger, you have to kind of think, estimate where it's gonna get caught. And you want that knot away from, the, from that particular pulley. So these are all the additional things that you have to think about repairing these. So that this is the repair of that uh, last patient with the metal, ring and small finger zone two injury, it's okay. I mean, she's got good extension and good flexion, but as you can see, she lacks a little bit of DIP flexion. And she's a recreational pianist. So this is, the dem this is her demonstrating sort of the, the independent motion of each finger. So pretty good, but I think I think we could probably do a little bit better job with this. So let's go to, uh, uh, here's the second example, similar zone two injury. I think we consider most things here. We have a six core stitch, locking cruciate with the horizontal mattress with the uh, 405 fiber wire. Tendon purchase is about centimeters away from the repair site, as you can see on both tendons. Uh, we have epitendinous uh, suture with a usually 5-0 five, or 6-0 proline or PDS. And I did, I was mindful of where the knot was placed away from the proximal pulley in this case because I didn't want to get tethered. And of course, you, you flex and extend, make sure there's no gapping at the, at the repair site.
Okay. And this is that same patient. And here's our outcome. I think in her case, there's a little bit better um, DIP flexion and good extension. So we talked about a lot of things. So what did we not talk about so far? These are the images from the, the prior two cases. What's missing here? I'll give you a few, few seconds to kind of figure this out. What's missing? Right, pulleys, they're missing pulleys, right? Where are the pulleys? All you see is naked tendons. And so the question is, how much pulley do you need to maintain good flexion? And there are many, many variations of biomechanical studies. It's difficult to keep track of them all. How much pulley is truly needed? Furthermore, the methods of all the studies are very different. So it's really impossible to compare the two and understand what is actually clinically relevant. This is a, a small case series of same uh, seven patients. The authors concede that it's a very small number of patients. However, a lot of reviewers commended this paper on the detailed documentation of how much was cut and how well that they documented the post-operative evaluation. And they released the entire A2 pulley, right? A2 pulley is the most important pulley that we talk about. And the results of in the releasing them all after a tendon repair, the patients actually ended up getting mostly good to excellent outcome. There were two tenolysis that was performed, and, um, and that's a little bit higher than, 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 than what's traditionally thought for these uh, acute repairs. But nonetheless, everybody, most of the patients ended up having good outcome here. Let's consider this example, right? This is the brand new patient. FDP has been already repaired, as you can see here distally. Which pulley do you think are vented here? And I'll give you a few seconds to kind of think about that. In this example, I think most of A3, C2, A4, C3, and C5 are vented, okay? Also, the war vented just means we cut it out. And the intact pulleys here are A1, A2, and C1. For the, for the junior residents, this will be a nice time to review the, the, the pulley order, right? You have the A1, A2, C1, and then you have A3, C2, A4, C3, and A5. Remember, don't trust everything you read. Pulleys are important, but you can cut them and still be okay. And by the way, this is the figure from Netter's Anatomy. I always like to point this out, but as you can see, it has an incorrect information. And if for those of you guys who have the book, you guys should open this chase and figure out what, what's kind of wrong with this picture. So this study investigated um, biomechanics of FDP tendon in a cadaver. So we talked about A2 pulley, potentially okay to release. And then now we're gonna talk about the A4 pulley, right? They cut the tendon, they repaired it. And then they sequentially cut, you know, either half of A A4, all of A4, and then A4 plus additional sheath. And they found that the work reflection compared to a baseline condition changed about 3% by rele releasing the A4 pulley. So not much. In fact, intact pulley actually had increased work reflection due to the bulkiness of the repair. And if you look at the numbers in biomechanical studies, 
A4 poorly released us very little to the overall excursion. Excursion length, um, a change in peak force or changing energy. So in normal sort of setting, you have the FDP, which generates about 45 units of peak force. Tendon excursion is about three centimeters. And then the muscle generates about 1.3 joule of energy. Once you release the pulley completely, changing peak force is about one to two newtons out of 45 newtons, so very minimal. Changing excursion is about one to two millimeters, which is also much, which is also minimal compared to three centimeters. And then the amount of energy to flex that finger changes by about two to 18 millijoules. Again, once again, pretty negligible compared to uh, uh, based on a normal condition. So this is that same patient where I showed you uh, where we cut the pulley and this is, this is range of motion. So this is the one that I vented all the, all the pulleys and the outcome is actually pretty good. He's got a good DIP flexion. And, um, you know, for me, this is, this is an excellent outcome. In 2014, they had this flexor uh, tendon um, injury committee, uh, committee, and it's kind of a it's kind of a paper where it's like a more interview and response, where the experts kind of gather together and they kind of tell them what they do, and almost everybody except for one, and I won't say who, but except for one, everybody is very comfortable releasing up to two thirds of both A2 and A4 pulley, or all of A4 pulley if necessary, and none of them actually went back and repaired the pulleys after the tendon repair. So for me, after all that, my rule is vent the pulley when you have to and don't vent when you don't. So when it gets into the, the knot and it gets in the way of the good repair or impinges on the, uh, uh, against the flexor sheath, then I have no problem cutting them out to get good excursion of the tendon and get a good repair of the flexor tendon. I wanna just briefly talk about um, zone one injury because I think this is personally very difficult for me. Trying to get bone tendon interface to heal, I think it's challenging. The pull-out suture um, with external button is one of the most popular ones. Um, and in many US, uh, many places in US still prefer this. I prefer the pull-out suture with the bone tunnel technique. Um, it doesn't require buttons, but you do get knots and you can get nail plate deformity. And it's kind of funny that this, this is the letter that uh, European fellows who were training in the United States wrote to Journal of Hand Surgery, the European version of it, kind of making fun of the United States for still using buttons to repair these. And they prefer this sort of transverse interosseous loop technique or also known as tilt. It's basically you put a 21 gauge uh, wire and then you put a suture through it and you weave the tendon repair and therefore you don't have to go through the, the dorsal side of the finger. And basically our, our, our friends from Rochester kind of compare all the techniques including suture anchors and found that, uh, um, that there's really no difference in the ultimate load and work to ferry in all techniques. So I haven't personally done that technique, but I'm certainly interested in doing it. I'm gonna stop there. I was gonna talk about two-stage reconstruction, but I think I'm out of time. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Can you, um, so we do not have any questions left. The questions that were posed were answered. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to the break, uh, which goes until 1140, and then we'll start with Dr. Polich at 1140. So I'm just going to put up during the break uh, some information about our sponsors. Uh, you can take a look at that on a little slideshow. Uh, and I just want to thank all the morning speakers. Those were really outstanding lectures. And I think all of us from residents and fellows to, to people who have been in practice for 20, 30 years learned something. So thank you.
I, I apologize. So there are some questions uh, that just did come up. Uh, so I'm gonna read them. Hopefully our, our panelists are still there. Uh, we have a lecture, a question for Dr. Kim. In zone two flexor tendons injuries, do you repair both the FDS and FDP tendon or only the FDP tendon? Um, a great question. Um, if the F, sometimes the FDS, I, I, if it's distal where it attaches, it's pretty flat and pretty flimsy. Um, so it's hard to get a good grasp, but I do try to repair them, but I don't do like this whole four core or six core stitch, maybe generally like a figure of eight, whatever kind of accepted. And um, I do try that. I typically do one slip only. Um, if the quality is not very good and you don't, I, I, you, you don't think they can get a repair, then, then I have no problem not repairing them. I've had once where I had, uh, you know, my, I talked about my re-ruptures in the past. I had a guy who re-ruptured his FDP, but somehow managed to keep his FDS intact. And he was actually happy with the function of his FDS finger. So that kind of saved me. So I do, you know, if, if the conditions are right, I, I do repair them. But it's it's case by case decision. Okay, another question for Dr. Kim: Do most surgeons do Wallant for flexor tendon repairs? Wallant, for those who don't know, is wide awake local anesthesia, no tourniquet. No, I don't. I don't do Wallant. So so, but I think it is a, one of the huge benefits that you can start to you can see the active flexion. So what I do is because my because I I prefer my patients not talking to me. Um, I, I fix them and then I, I aggressively move them. I mean, I test out that repair to make sure that there's no gapping and there's no impingement of the knot at the sheath. Um, and I then, so I, I, I really do a very careful intraoperative assessment with the passive motion. And, and for, you know, until now, at least it's been my, I think the, the, the outcome has been satisfactory. I'll just answer that for myself. It, it really depends upon what you're repairing. And obviously if you have multiple nerves and a vessel, but, but for most flexor tendons now, if, if the patient is, if you think the patient could tolerate it, I do them under Wallant um, with a little sedation. That way you can see actively whether anything impinges and the gapping. Um, certainly you can evaluate that better with them actively pulling, but you have to have the right patient, obviously. Um, so another question, I assume for Dr. Kim, uh, what are your thoughts on loop suture? What do you mean like loop sutures? You mean like a super mid? I guess is what they're talking about. So I, I'm going to assume that's the I case. So. Yeah. Yeah. So super mid. Yeah, I love them. Um, so I use four fiber wire. Um, loop sutures are totally fine to use. Um, and I think they're designed for flexor tendon repair. Um, I think it's, I don't, I don't think the suture material actually matters more so than not any more than your technique. So I personally like cushiate repair, but I lock each throw at the edge. So that it's a lock, it's a completely locking construct. So then the problem, and then the question comes, well, then how do you sort of, get that nice little, that little clumping to prevent gapping. I actually do a horizontal mattress first. So I do a horizontal mattress and then I just, and, and you have a very good control of how, how much tension you put onto that repair. And you, once you like that, just the subtle, subtle clump of that flexor tendon and you're happy with it, then I proceed with a locking cruciate repair, which is a four core stitch. So now you have a six core stitch and that, cruciate repair is almost like a, almost think of it like a bridge plate or, or a neutralizing plate is just to hold a tendon at, at, at that perfect length that you've created with the horizontal mattress. And that locking construct is very, very strong. I mean, you cannot, you cannot rep that out. And um, uh, that's generally how I, I, I do it. But you can do that core stitch with a super mid uh, uh, loop sutures. And I think that's totally fine. 
Dr. Kim is very popular. So we have another question for you. How many knots are you throwing on your flexor tendon repairs? Uh, usually around, well, you know, seven is my lucky number. So I use seven, <laughs> <laughs> but, but each, each, each knot, I cannot stress this enough, um, has to be cinched down. You think it's cinched and it's not cinched. And I think that's the biggest problem with these repairs re-rupturing. So if like the one that the example that I showed you, you have the, the three finger repair. When you have multiple finger flexor tendon repair, and then let's say you do the small finger first, and then you go to the ring finger and you go to the you go to the middle finger, just look back at the small finger repair. I'm telling you, your knot is already starting to be undone. So you, you have to really take that time to cinch that knot down. Yeah, and I agree. Um, although I, I think that um, it's certainly a balance between uh, doing enough knots and you obviously don't want your knot to impinge uh, but or be bulky, but I think at the minimum four knots. And another question for Dr. Kim. Uh, it, it's interesting that when there's no clumping, you had more re-ruptures. Did you notice that the re-ruptures at any site, at any specific time period, for example, at two weeks when the tendon is the weakest? Uh, yeah, it's usually within two to four weeks. I've, I've had, I have ruptures that come after. So I generally start therapy whenever I see them back on a first post-op visit which let's say is about 10 to 15 days. I've gotten a little bit more aggressive, but at that time when I was doing it, it was about 10 to 15 days. It looked good, good flexion. And then we start the therapy and they come back in another two weeks to, to make sure that the tendon is intact. And that's when I see it uh, rupture. So that's, yeah. So guys, you, you have to clump the tendon a little bit. Don't try to make it look perfect, which is what I did. And then I, I started to get a little gapping. And then I think that's why it ruptured. Um. So, so for everybody who's still on, just I'm going to um, pose this to Dr. Kim. Uh, just can you briefly discuss your post-operative protocol, whether you're using early active motion? Uh, um... So, um, I yeah, I do. I I pretty much give the therapist free reign on what they want to do, um, and I actually when I when I speak with the therapist. I, I, I tell them, hey, listen, if this tendon ruptures, it's not your fault, it's mine. And so then they, they can get aggressive with them. Um, you know, only like if, if, if the tendon is kind of frayed and I'm very, very worried that this may rupture just because the, the quality of the tendon is so poor during the repair, then I will personally call the therapist and say, hey, I'm a little bit worried about this. It's not my usual flexor tendon, just go a little bit more gent gentle on it. And so I do communicate that to the therapist personally, but I, I do, I do now, um, I see them back, you know, it, it depends on your office hour schedule, but I see them back within a week or, or at week. And then, and then I give them a extension blocking splint and then I have them start the active flexor protocol and uh, the therapists are kind of do what they are trained to do, but I do allow them to, to actively flex the fingers down all the way to the palm if they can. So I, have a, I give them very little restrictions other than weight bearing and then sudden passive extension. I, I try to avoid. So Dr. Kim, there's been actually several requests for the two-stage reconstruction lecture. And um, you know, since a lot of people are on break and are not here, um, I don't want to put you on the stop spot, but would you be kind enough to record that portion of your lecture and then we'll upload it to the website along with the other pre-recorded lectures? Oh, that's that's no problem at all. We're actually making a video on it. So we'll just post that once it's finished. Thank you. Um, even though this is break, I think if who's ever on, um, I have a question for Dr. Nellens. Could you just go over your exact protocol and follow up for your mallet injuries? meaning simple soft tissue mallets that you're splinting? Yeah, so I like Dr. Posner said, I prefer the dorsal splint um, when I see them. So long as they're within the first six weeks, I typically um, will splint them and kind of treat it like new. After about six weeks, I feel like it's not really gonna be that helpful. 
Um, so I placed the dorsal splint. I actually have a handout made um, for them to show how to change it at home. I asked them to change it at two weeks. Um, I see them at four weeks. They change it again two weeks later and I see them at eight weeks. Um, and then we switch to nighttime splinting only um, for another four weeks. So I tell them this is a three month uh, kind of ordeal. Um, and I would tell you, you know, dorsal splinting lets most people type um, and they're pretty functional. It's annoying for showers and having to wash hands. So I think my one kind of exception for the splinting is for healthcare workers or my orthopedic trauma partner who gave himself a mallet finger. Um, I'll put a 6-2K longitudinal K wire in um, and leave that for eight weeks. I assume you cut the pin beneath the skin for those, correct? Yeah, um, I just get the big bolt cutters and um, it, it seems to work pretty well. The, the skin, if you kind of push it back, cut it and then pull it, it back up and I put a stitch over top of it to kind of encourage the skin to heal. Um, it seems to be pretty well tolerated. So I've done that for dentists and nurses and again, some surgeons. Six weeks versus eight weeks. Any thoughts from the panel? I go eight. It's just my preference. I feel like at six, there's, there's still tender there. Maybe some kids, like if, if, it's just not how I see them back. So I usually don't see them at that six week mark, whether they self DC their splint and start kind of using a little bit, I don't know. Um, but I just feel like they're still tender usually at six. So I, I keep it till eight until they're non-tender. That's, that's my clinical kind of judgment. Yeah. For me personally, I think a lot of it depends on how the mechanism of injury happened. Um, if it's truly a bony mallet and I'm not concerned that there is also a tendon, um, stretch injury, then I'll often treat it like a fracture. So six weeks of splinting and then start getting them moving. Um, the other thing I do want to mention is over the years, I've changed from dorsal splinting to actually giving the patients three different splints. I give them a stack splint, I give them a dorsal splint and a bowler splint and show them how to change the splints because I've had a lot of patients with a lot of sensitivity on that dorsal skin. Um, and if they're not going to wear their splint because it's painful, then I would prefer that they alternate throughout the day or even um, multiple times throughout the day with different types of splints. So yes, I do like the dorsal splint because it's the most functional, um, but then I give their skin bridge a little bit of a, a break so they're not under constant pressure. Yeah, my two cents worth are, um, when I follow these patients fairly often, at least, have them come back at one or two weeks because I find that many of these patients end up uh, not putting their splint on in the correct position and the, the finger is flexed down. And if you have them stay like that for four to six weeks, it's doing nothing. Um, the other thing is it, it, it really depends upon the finger. So if you have a woman with a little finger mallet injury, you, you, you know those patients are not going to do well no matter what. Um, they're going to end up with some loss of extension. So you, you definitely just want to set expectations for these injuries. So there's a question from the audience. Uh, how do you treat a soft tissue mallet that presents after six weeks? Maybe Dr. Posner can answer that. Is he still on? Not, maybe Dr. Nellens? Yeah, I mean, I think you can have a talk with them about how how um on it like if they are okay with the deformity i mean some 65 year old people with some pre-existing arthritis are seem to be okay with a little bit of a bend in their finger some kind of younger patients may not be um i think i explained what a dermatotenodesis might look like um and it's very it's doable um i think i'm pretty aggressive with the amount of tissue I take away and I actually pin them in hyperextension um, for about six weeks. So if they're willing to have a pin <clears throat> sticking out of their finger, and I suppose I could bury it just like I do for a um, kind of just a regular uh, soft tissue and um, healthcare workers, but um, I get, yeah, but if they're willing to undergo that, uh, I think I, I offer it um, for the chronic mouth.
Okay, so I think um, the questions are done and we have about five minutes and then we'll restart um, uh, with Dr. Pollich. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Rich.
You guys able to hear me? Hear me? I know we're not starting for another minute. Just want to make sure we're all set. Yeah, can hear you. And you can see my slide deck. Yep. Although I don't think we call that anymore. Slide deck. You can see your intro slide. Thank you. How you doing, Larry? I had Good. an How intro you? slide to go before you, but that's okay. Feel free to jump in. <laughs> No, because you have to then unshare, but then reshare again. It's it's fine. I'll just introduce you in a minute. All right, All right. ten thirty nine. Okay, ten forty a.m. Welcome back, everyone, again. Um, thank you again to our sponsors for uh, supplementing our ability to offer this course uh, free for everyone online and, and uh, pre-recorded lectures. And um, we'll go straight to the next lecture, the esteemed Dr. Polich, our former president, who will be discussing fingertip injuries. Thank you, Renata. Uh, my name is Dan Polich. I'm the co-director of the New York Hand and Wrist Center of Lenox Hill. And uh, I'm going to be talking today about fingertip injuries. I have no relevant disclosures, except that I will be on time, so I don't miss that much of the Michigan-Indiana football game. Except it's not advanced. Oh, yeah. Hang on one sec. So fingertip injuries are the uh, one of the most common injuries of the hand, typically in older children and young adults men much more than women with the middle finger most commonly affected. Over 30,000 injuries per year seen in the emergency room with half of these involving um, a finger fracture. The anatomy of the pernicium is uh, very highly specialized. Uh, it's a highly specialized structure which contributes to precision function of the hand through tactile feedback and fine motor control. Uh, the skin has abundant fibro fatty tissue that's stabilized by multiple fibrous septa. So if you look on the illustration on the bottom, you see these septa that go from the dermis to the periosteum. Um, these are the septa that you need to divide um, when you're INDing a felon, which Renata will talk about on the next, uh, the next presentation, but they don't allow for mobilization of the skin too, too easily. It's uh, got very thick epidermis and it's uh, glabrous uh, skin. Uh, the anatomy is a little bit unique. If you look up at the upper illustration, uh, these are some of the terms that we use to describe the structures. The hyponychium is the tissue at the distal aspect of the fingertip just below the nail plate. The sterile matrix is the tissue responsible for the nail plate's adherence to the nail bed. The germinal matrix is responsible for the nail plate's growth and where the nail comes from. The epinicule fold is the skin tissue that um, comes out distally over the dorsum of the fingertip that rests on the proximal aspect of the nail plate. The lunula is the moon-shaped uh, white structure at the base of the nail plate. Uh, and again, if you look closely, you can see where uh, how much fibro fatty tissue there is. If you look at the end of the, look how much tissue on this illustration is there before the end of the finger. There's plenty of padding, which is important. Goals of treatment are to have a painless fingertip, durable, sensate skin. You want a well-padded fingertip. You want to maintain length whenever possible, in particular on the thumb. You want to preserve the nail bed and the nail plate, and ideally early range of motion and a good cosmetic result is ideal. When you initially see these patients in the emergency room or in your office, you want to get a very good evaluation. Um, so you got to control the bleeding, and often one of these commercial uh, digital tourniquets can be utilized or a Penrose drain. Sometimes you have to administer a digital block or wrist block so you can adequately assess and wash it out and assess what structures are exposed or damaged. And you want to think about um, several things when you're looking at these patients. Is there loss of tissue, in particular the pulp space? Is there exposed bone? Is there a fracture? Always get an x-ray. What's the status of the nail bed? what's the level uh, and angle of the amputation. And then the thumb has uh, certain uh, factors that are uh, most important to treat. And then what about the patient specific factors, their age, any comorbidities, what's their uh, work status, uh, do they need to get back to work right away, things like this. And probably the most important, which I um, talk about it every time in the OR with the residents, is to remove the tourniquet at the end of uh, your evaluation 
This is from 2019, a teenager a cricket player who had a thumb distal phalanx injury uh, under a long lasting digital block, went home that weekend, complaining of pain, called a gave pain medicine, said come in on, on Monday. And when she came in, uh, she had a dead finger. Um, so that should never happen. Always, always, always remove the tourniquet. The classic uh, classification for fingertip injuries by Rosenthal describes it, whether there is exposed bone, zone one, no exposed bone, zone two, there is exposed bone, but there's enough distal phalanx that you could preserve length and there, you wouldn't have a hook nail. Zone three, it's at the level of a lunula or more proximal. And in general, those more typical of doing a shortening or revision amputation. And then we have a descriptive classification. The descriptive classification is just where the soft tissue loss is. So on the top illustration, that's a dorsal oblique amputation with more dorsal loss than volar loss. Uh, the bottom one is a volar oblique amputation. And you can have a combination, volar ulnar oblique. And it's very good for um, uh, describing these over the phone or to whoever's on call. So if there's no exposed bone, uh, obviously you can just suture the wound if it's something that's suturable. Uh, but often uh, there's not a lot lot of mobile dermis, so it's uh, very hard to advance the tissue. And uh, I always see these patients come in where someone hogged it together with 2O nylon, not really the great, great way to do it. Um, if there is a wound that's less than a centimeter by a centimeter, um, no exposed bone, you can let this heal by secondary intention, multiple different ways to treat it with dressing changes. But in general, universally, patients have an excellent result. Uh, if it's more than a centimeter by a centimeter, you can also do it with dressing changes. It just takes uh, longer, um, but also has an excellent result. Um, some people feel that skin grafting these or using acellular dermal matrix uh, is better because you get um, prompt coverage. Uh, the grafts can be used from the hypothenar eminence, the palm, the amputated part, the wrist. Uh, and we'll see some examples of, of that in the, uh, later on in the talk. Uh, the benefit of uh, covering it is you get immediate coverage, but you do need to immobilize it to prevent shearing. Uh, people are often left with cold intolerance and diminished sensation. When there is uh, bone exposed, exposed, the uh, best treatment is always controversial, and it depends on who you talk to and how they, uh, what their training level is. So obviously, you can do a revision amputation if it's shortened. Um, if you can try uh, reattaching the amputated part, uh, not a microvascular reattachment, but someone who's got bone, uh, soft tissue, fat, skin, you can try a non-vascular composite graft. And surprisingly, a large percent of these can take or at least partially take. Uh, and if, if nothing else, it can be a biologic dressing. And the typical factors that make it more likely um, to take are a younger age, non-smokers, non-diabetics, et cetera. Uh, in terms of flap coverage, uh, we'll get into this, but you can do uh, local or regional flaps, acellular dermal matrix, we've been using a lot more in the last you know, five to eight years. The treatment choice is individualized, and that's not just for the patient. So the patient has specific goals and the type of injury sort of predicates what you're gonna do, but also the person treating them, depending on what their experience is and what their comfort level is. And then what about the timing of these? So uh, 20 years ago, when we were first in practice, uh, some people were doing this in the middle of the night. Uh, we've clearly proven that you don't need to do this uh, in the middle of the night. Having a little bit of bone exposed, you can wash it out, put a little zero form on it and see it in the clinic and put it on the next uh, OR day. Uh, we looked at this and presented it in 2012 with 32 digits, all with exposed bone, various flaps. The average time from injury to uh, flap coverage was eight days. None of them got infected. Um, so this is something that you can easily uh, send out. So in general, if there's sufficient nail matrix that remains to provide a stable and adherent nail plate, then consider a local advancement flap. Um, so that's the simplest and most easy one uh, to do. If the angle of the amputation does not permit a local advancement flap, so that's a volar oblique soft tissue loss, then consider a regional flap. That's sort of the next complicated procedure. And if the amputation is more proximal or the patient is a poor candidate or needs to get back to work very quickly, consider uh, revision, amputation, and shortening. Um, when you do a revision amputation, uh, you want to make sure you ablate the nail bed because that's your best chance of not getting some of the uh, nail plate growing out uh, for the patient's uh, duration of their life. It's hard to remove uh, when they come in late, um, when the anatomy has been operated on several times. You wanna shorten and bury the digital nerves so they don't get an aroma. 
If there's uh, abundant skin, you'd like to advance the volar skin over the tip of the finger because that's glabrous and it has more padding than the dorsal skin uh, and never uh, advance the profundus uh, over the bone because you can end up with a quadriga effect. When I was in high school, Ronnie Lott was a super well-known uh, receiver for the 49ers and he had an amputation of his small finger and he said, we can reattach it, but you'll be out for the remainder of the season or we can throw it in the bucket and you can get back there uh, and play. And obviously that's why that's what he did. Now let's talk about uh, local flaps. So these are uh, ideal when you can perform them. They preserve length. Skin grafting is not necessary. It's similar tissue that you're covering the defect with. And typically you can end up with normal uh, sensory uh, end uh, organs. So you have normal sensation. And the classic one is the Adesoy which is a volar uh, advancement flap, the Cutler less commonly used, which is a lateral, and the Moberg, which is for the thumb. If we look at the illustration on the left, that's the Adesoy. It's a uh, triangular shaped flap based at the DIP flexion crease. You wanna divide those fibrous septa that we spoke about in the second or third slide, and you're basically uh, hinging this on the neurovascular bundles radially and elderly, and you can advance it, sew it to the uh, nail plate or nail bed, and convert the V to a Y. Here's a clinical example of a transverse amputation with exposed bone, a V converted to a Y, and here's the uh, clinical result, which is uh, quite good. If you can't do a local advancement flap, now you have to start thinking about regional flaps. So these are derived from tissue not immediately adjacent to the defect or the amputation part. Uh, these are primarily for volar oblique amputations. These are ideal because they preserve length. However, they do often require two stages. And so older patients, you get worried about stiffness and they're in general a insensate graft, but yet for some reason, people do get pretty good sensation from them. The cross finger flap uh, is a random pattern flap based uh, over the dorsal aspect of the middle phalanx of an adjacent digit. You can skin graft the donor side or use the dermal matrix. Um, and this works quite well. However, often there is a color mismatch in particular with patients with dark skin. So here's an example of someone with a volar oblique amputation of the middle finger. A uh, cross finger flap was uh, placed with skin grafting uh, over the donor site. The skin was taken from the uh, dorsal aspect of the index finger. And here, patient has an excellent uh, functional result, but you can see cosmetically uh, the discoloration in the skin, which is typical of the cross finger flap. The reverse cross finger flap uh, is similar, typically was used for dorsal uh, exposure of tendon or bone where you would sort of open book the skin and then secondly open book the uh, subcutaneous tissue and then skin graft it but this has largely been replaced with uh, the acellular dermal matrix you don't need to do that anymore um, the dnr flap i love it's a random pattern flap you got to be careful of the radial digital nerve much uh much more difficult to do this on the ring and the small finger uh, again you have to worry about pip joint stiffness there's generally not a donor defect because most of us do this H flap, which you can see illustrated on the right. When you divide it, you can advance the proximal flap distally and the distal flap proximally to cover the, the donor site. My uh, former partner, Charlie Malone, wrote the sort of quintessential paper on 150 patients uh, that had this. The three guiding principles were designing the flap near the MP uh, flexion crease of the thumb fully flex the MP and the DIP joint of the affected finger so you minimize maximum flexion of the PIP joint um, during the immobilization period and then divide at uh, about two weeks. And surprisingly, had an excellent uh, uh, clinical result. And actually their sensation in that study was seven millimeters, which has been actually proven by one of our studies in addition to multiple other additional studies, which doesn't make a lot of sense how they get such good two point, uh, but they do. Here's an example, sorry of a transverse amputation with exposed bone. This is prior to dividing the graft two weeks later. Here's the patient at around five or six weeks with an excellent cosmetic result um, with uh, minimal stiffness on the donor site. You can see the H graft at the base of the thumb. About six years ago, this uh, young woman came into my office with two volar oblique amputations with exposed bone. Um, and so this requires a little bit of you know, talk to the patient, see what's best for her. Do you do one thinar flap, one cross finger flap, two cross finger flaps? Um, I decided to do a double thinar flap. Um, had never uh, heard of doing one of these, but I know how vascular they are. The, the skin, I wasn't really worried about the skin not surviving. 
Uh, this is prior to division. Um, I actually had to take uh, some skin from the palm to uh, skin graft proximal to the middle finger because there was uh, more tissue loss there. And here she is at a year with an outstanding uh, clinical result, uh, which we published in 2017 journal hand surgery. Uh, the next sort of complicated uh, flap is a reverse homo digital island flap. I don't really do these. This is based on the fact that digits have built in arterial redundancy. The flap is derived by dividing the proper digital artery proximally. You leave the nerve alone. It pivots around the transverse arch. And uh, the, the boards and the in-training and self-assessments love asking what the most common complication of this is. And it's a flap loss because you're pivoting the flap, um, the pivot point about 180 degrees. Here's a flap being uh, mobilized before it's rotated in. And here's a, an example now, or an old example, of one being rotated into place. Most people now would do um, a cellular dermal matrix for this. Um, let's talk about the thumb. Similar principles, but even more important to preserve length and sensibility. Uh, small tissue loss can be treated similar to the other digits with local advancement flaps, uh, dressing changes, skin grafting. Uh, however, uh, the thumb has a unique dorsal skin arterial supply, uh, which allows us to do this Moberg flap. So the, the dorsal skin is provided by its own blood supply. However, in the index through little finger, the dorsal skin gets its blood supply from the proper digital artery. So if you were to do these bilateral mid-axial incisions, uh, you could across the dorsal skin. So you can't do this in those digits. Um, basically, you advance the flap with the nerve vascular pedicles. You can advance it about two and a half centimeters by flexing the IP joint. You can even make a cutback at the uh, volar aspect of the NP flexion crease. Uh, and this is ideal because it's a thumb, you need sensation, and this is sensate skin. Here's one from a few years ago, amputated transverse thumb with uh, exposed bone. Um, this is after flexing the IP joint. This was a little bit of an older woman. Here she is at nine weeks, excellent cosmetic result, had a little bit of I IP arthritis, uh, which required a fair amount of therapy to get back uh, you know, close to full extension of her IP joint. Um, if the wound is bigger than that, and you don't think you can cover it with a Moberg, you can do a first dorsal metacarpal artery island flap. Uh, this is a pedicle flap based on the dorsal uh, radial artery branch and one of the radial sensory nerve branches. Uh, again, you can uh, skin graft or uh, dermal matrix the donor site, um, and it, wo it works quite well, but it does uh, require cortical reintegration, um, so not as good for uh, older patients. Uh, because it's uh, their sensation is it's it's their sen they do get sensation but it's it's not the same. And uh, finally, for the thumb and nerve vascular island pedicle flap, uh, similar. It's based on the ulnar nerve vascular bundle, the artery, and the nerve to either the middle or the um, ring finger, and you can tunnel it either under the sort of thenar area or make an incision. Um, here's an example of one harvested from the ulnar aspect of the middle finger, uh, sewn in place, and the donor site. Uh, uh, skin grafted. Um, a special uh, two slides for kids with amputations. Um, every every time I give this talk, there's always another uh, stroller that gets recalled. This one was actually just from a month ago. 14,000 baby strollers um, uh, recalled because um, one or two kids put their fingers in one of the locking mechanisms and had uh, had an amputation. Um, if it's uh, less, if the child is less than three, definitely reattach the composite um, uh, amputated part, they have a very high chance of um, it taking uh, because of their age. Three to eight, you can uh, also use composite graft or DFAT and use as a graft. Uh, older than eight, treat it similar to an adult. And in very small kids, even a small amount of um, exposed bone actually do quite well. A recent study also in the last few years want us to be alert that um, these injuries could be a sign of abuse and neglect, especially if it's been repeated uh, fingertip injuries in kids less than 12, so be aware of this. Uh, they found a higher incidence of this in patients with Medicaid, uh, white race, and behavioral disorders such as ADHD, autism, depression, and aggressive behavior, so be alert for that. Uh, we discussed dermal substitutes, uh, which have very promising results. Um, these are glycosaminoglycan uh, uh, matrix with a silicone sort of bilayer on top. 
Uh, it was initially utilized for burn and tumor patients. Um, it can be applied directly to exposed bone, uh, tendon, and joint, and it basically functions as an artificial scaffolding for new dermis that grows in and new epidermis. So smaller wounds, you don't even need to skin graft, they can grow in from the side. Um, a study uh, not too long ago looked at 36 fingertips, all just treated with this, and patients were quite happy with no graft failures. However, the length and width was not adequately restored, which you can imagine because you're not, there's no subcutaneous fat that you are um, transposing, which you do with some of these uh, local and regional flaps. Uh, people are using this for things such as syndactyly. Chuck Goldfarb is doing this with excellent results. You don't need to skin graft. Here's an example of a, a dorsal wound with exposed uh, tendon and joint that uh, in the past people would do a reverse dorsal uh, cross finger flap. And now you can put this Integra on, uh, peel off the silicone bilayer at three weeks and it heals in quite well. Here's an example of a patient of mine who was an NFL quarterback, throwing hand, small finger, had a concerning uh, lesion, possibly a, a cellular uh, dermatofibroma versus some type of malignancy. Uh, we excise it. I put this uh, uh, acellular dermal matrix. You can see after I, before I put the bolster on, on the third slide uh, on the top, and then the bolster, you can see the size of the lesion. Um, this is at three weeks after you take off the silicone bilayer. And then a few weeks later, it actually heals in quite well. It was benign and uh, you know, he's obviously playing. Um, and now a few questions. I think we're on time. Uh, this is a 26-year-old uh, uh, male with an amputated uh, fingertip of his thumb with exposed bone. The most uh, appropriate management at this time is definitive debridement and uh, daily saline soaks and dressing changes. No, there's exposed bone. Uh, cross finger flap closure, you could do that, but that doesn't have sensate skin. So there are better options such as the Moberg uh, interphalangeal joint disarticulation and closure. Uh, no, you want to preserve length uh, in the thumb. The condition on the ring finger is a result of which problem? Looks like the patient had ring and small finger uh, partial amputation. Small finger has a hook nail. Absent distal phalanx, no. Uh, scar in the tuft, incorrect. Incomplete removal of the dermal matrix, uh, correct. He has a remnant of the nail uh, growing. Um, incomplete removal of the sterile matrix. No, that's the sterile matrix is responsible for adherence of the nail plate and loss of bony support under the nail bed. I uh, know that produces a, a hook nail, which is what you see in the small finger. And then the last slide, which component of the fingernail depicted in figure one is the eponychium. Uh, so A is the hyponychium. Uh, B looks like they're pointing to the sterile matrix. Uh, C looks like they're pointing to the uh, lunula. D looks like the uh, eponychium. And E, the insertion of the terminal tendon. Uh, thank you. Okay, so now that Dan has logged off, I'll be logging on. Okay, and um, just a reminder, there will be a question and answer session um, at the conclusion of this second half. Um, so uh, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions about individual lectures in the second half at that time. Thank you. So I'm uh, Renata Weber. I will be discussing uh, hand infections. So first of all, um, short introduction, even a small, almost misleadingly inconsequential hand injury or hand infection can lead to something pretty serious if misdiagnosed or not treated appropriately. The biggest problem with hand infections is that it causes a lot of hand swelling, which gives you then um, a poor outcome in terms of a function and motion. Adhesions uh, will cause loss of uh, vital structures and um, sometimes an amputation uh, is even necessary and a small wound can uh, lead to a partial amputation or even a total amputation of the finger or hand, depending on how bad the, uh, the infection is. Correct management is early diagnosis and correct diagnosis, early aggressive surgical or medical treatment, depending on the uh, type of infection. Uh, early mobilization and rehab. And in the past, there was a lot of talk about splinting. Um, however, this is um, 
not as commonly used anymore as it was in the past. Although there are some uh, occasions where you do need to splint, at least temporarily. The pathophysiology of hand infections, uh, it's usually a direct, a direct penetration of the skin, although you can have hematogenous spread um, in somebody who is uh, septic and bacteria is circulating in the bloodstream and then it seeds the uh, skin or um, joints. Um, the most common hematogenous spread I've seen is from people with previous MRSA infections, which then develop spontaneous abscesses in their soft tissue, or uh, as mentioned before, um, septic joints. Uh, the local tissue becomes edematous, which then impair, impairs the circulation, and you can get microvascular thrombosis and ischemia, and um, abscesses can form. The most typical bacteria is gonna be your staph, and there is a lot of MRSA now in the community, which uh, was not the case 15, 20 years ago. Streptococcus is another common bacteria, but you also have to be mindful of less common bacterias uh, from the GI, uh, TB, anaerobics, Pasteurella specifically from uh, animal bites and Iconella from uh, human bites. And um, additional unusual presentations can be from viral, fungal, and spirochetes. Pre-treatment evaluation, sometimes uh, x-ray is always uh, necessary. However, MRI, CT scan, ultrasound may add some additional information depending on the type of uh, infection you have. Uh, lab tests, CBC for sure is useful. Uh, I personally don't use the ESR and CRP that much unless I'm dealing with a chronic infection or something that's just not following a typical uh, bacterial infection straightforward case. Uh, as mentioned before, principles of treatment are going to be early decompression if you have an abscess, warm soaks either with betadine or with liquid soap. Um, I personally prefer a light dressing, make it easy. If it's a complicated dressing change, number one, the nurses won't do it. Number two, the patients won't do it. And in fact, I often tell the patients, if the nurse hasn't come back to do your dressing change in the time frame that I would like them to have it done, take it upon yourself, do it, and then have them come back and give you more supplies. Um, Appropriate antibiotics when applicable. Not every hand infection needs antibiotics, although the majority will need antibiotics. And then again, splinting in some occasions when you have a lot of swelling to the hand or a lot of pain, splinting may be useful. Um, however, early mobilization and getting them into OT is probably more important than splinting. Uh, there's different types of hand infections from a most superficial cellulitis, a skin infection to deeper infections and uh, tenosynovitis specifically will be discussed later as it's uh, by Dr. Grossman. Um, and I'm going to mostly focus on the first three, cellulitis, paronychia, epinychia, and uh, felon. So cellulitis presents with redness, swelling, and pain to the skin. Usually it's very painful because the nerve endings are in the skin and your skin is inflamed. Uh, it's usually associated with a break in the skin and patients will need either PO antibiotics. And usually when that fails, they end up back in the emergency room, in which case you admit them for IV antibiotics. And again, elevation to help with the edema and with the swelling and warm compresses and um, hand soaks. So here's an example of a patient who comes in. They come to the ER because two days ago they were scratched by their cat. So looking at this, it doesn't look that bad, terrible, but should you admit or not? So this is cellulitis. In this case, because of the fact that it was a cat bite or cat scratch, I would admit this patient unless they really adamantly don't want to be admitted, in which case I would have them come back in a day or two to make sure that the PO antibiotics are actually working. But because the cat, um, both nails and their teeth are very sharp, you can have bacteria that's pushed deeper into the skin um, as opposed to a dog bite or human bite, which generally do more trauma to the skin and to the soft tissue, but leave open uh, larger gaping wounds that don't close uh, quickly, uh, in which case those can sometimes be treated as outpatient, depending again on the situation. An abscess is basically a collection of pus. 
um, depending on where it's uh, located in the fingertip, uh, paronychia and epinychia uh, can be drained um, with a 15 blade in order to uh, remove the, the purulence. When the uh, pus is in the fingertip, as in a felon, uh, you want to make sure that uh, all the septa are divided, not just a superficial incision to release the pus because you may um, miss half or a portion of the, um, the purulence. Um, and deep space abscesses in the hand, especially, there's a lot of uh, deep spaces with their own little eponyms and, and names. Um, but anything that is going to be deep under the fascia is going to need surgical uh, IND, just because it's difficult to reach and you will have an incomplete or um, incomplete drainage if you try to do this uh, at the bedside or in your office. So for paronychia, usually the infection is around the cuticle and most people develop this because they bite their nails. Um, so you have to be cognizant of the fact that there probably is gonna be skin flora in there and uh, treatment is IND. You may have to remove a portion of the nail. Sometimes the nail will actually begin to grow into the paronychium and uh, removing a portion of the nail allows not only drainage, but also prevents the ingrown nail, which can lead to subsequent or repetitive paronychias. And if untreated, this will lead or may lead to a felon. Uh, this is just an example showing how a paronychia can be drained. You can either drain it from the top or drain it between the nail and the, um, the cuticle. And again, warm soaks, IND, and when these are not treated or when there is repetitive infection, um, you may have to do what's called a marsupialization. I personally in 25 years have never done one, but we always talk about the fact that it may be necessary. And so what marsupialization is, is removing a portion of the paronychium while still leading, leaving that leading edge of cuticle uh, on the nail. You wanna leave the cuticle on the nail because that helps to actually um, mature your nail when it goes from the germinal matrix to the sterile matrix. And then I throw this in there because sometimes you'll get a call from the ER and, and the story is, oh, I have a patient, 20 year old dental hygienist, three days of pain and swelling to the finger. And you have to be very careful to make sure that they're not, uh, that it is actually an infection versus a herpetic whitlow, which is a herpes simplex infection. Uh, the herpes simplex virus will get into the skin and cause vesicles. So it's very similar to your cold stores or uh, varicella, so chicken pox, and you have that typical vesicular lesion. And these are also usually painful for about two to three days before the vessels show up. So also similar to shingles where you get vesicular um, lesions on the skin. These you do not want to IND because then you will spread additional vesicles to neighboring fingers or along that same finger. So these you want to treat with a antiviral like gancyclovir, fancyclovir. There's various different types on the market now. And um, just keeping it covered and letting it recover on its own. Uh, a felon is gonna be an infection on the volar pulp of your distal fingertip. These are also excruciatingly painful because there's so many septa on the volar side of the fingertip. And it's essentially a compartment syndrome of your fingertip because of the infection. And so these you want to uh, IND uh, if it's not treated, it can lead to a felon, uh, sorry, it can lead to tenosynovitis and it can lead to osteomyelitis of the distal fingertip. So one way to IND that is to just go through the most prominent part of your abscess. If the whole entire fingertip is pretty equally um, swollen, I prefer to make the incision on the non-critical surface. So for key pinch uh, of your fingers, I try to avoid the radial side of the fingertip and make my incision on the ulnar side. But usually uh, by the time these patients come to me, 
they're about to burst through the skin. So then I just make my incision directly in the, the dome of the mass, essentially. But if you do have a choice going either ulnar or radial of the finger, you want to go in the mid-axial plane, stay below the phalanx, and make sure that all the septa are divided. So superficial abscesses of the fingers. Um, anytime you have an incision, uh, an infection on the finger, it can always extend to the volar side. This is a patient that the residents in the ER, uh, I indeed, and this is not exactly the choice of where I would make my incision. Um, Whenever you have any infections on the volar side, even if it's not tenosynovitis just yet, but it's a superficial abscess, you still want to plan ahead what, if I need to go in to do a tendon reconstruction, where do I want to place my incisions? So then I make my incisions in the same direction as I would for um, a flexor tendon repair or a flexor tendon uh, tenosynovitis debridement. Um, not making necessarily all the incisions, but pre-planning so that in the event I have to connect the dots, I'm not making incisions that are now going to be a problem later on when I need to go to reconstruct. So this is a patient that came in, 45-year-old male with two to three days history of worsening pain and swelling. Initially, you look at the finger, ring finger's a little swollen, you think, okay, not too bad. If they don't give you the whole entire story, it could be misleading and you might see this picture and say, okay, the patient doesn't look that bad, give him some PO antibiotics, send him home. However, he tried to inject cocaine into a dorsal vein in his finger and he missed. And he knew right away that he missed because he said he had excruciating pain after that happened. So this particular gentleman was admitted. And after a couple of days of, after a day of IV antibiotics, some of the swelling went down, some of the cellulitis went down, but the finger is not looking so good. And this actually ended up progressing. I took him to the OR to debride uh, IND the abscess. He even had an osteo, acute osteomyelitis of the PIP joint. And then this continued to necrose further. Uh, luckily he still had peritinon. So this has been I've been treating and he's actually still in active treatment right now. I just ended up putting some of those skin substitute products that Dr. Polich mentioned on the previous presentation. And uh, he is slowly, slowly healing. Uh, deep space infections. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip through this because there's a lot of information online that you can look up in order to figure out where exactly should you make your incisions and how quickly should you uh, open up these deep space infections. But essentially, the treatment is IND because your um, deep space, and like I mentioned before, there are several deep space uh, deep spaces with their own personal names. But the take home point is that if it's below the fascia, it's not going to be easy to IND. And it's also going to be difficult to IND in your office or in the, uh, at the bedside, even when the patient has a really good wrist block. So these are just, just easier to do in the operating room. The three most common spaces in the hand is the thenar, your mid palm, and Peronas, which is going to be closer to the wrist. So the thenar space, it's underneath your thenar muscles. You want to be able to get to, um, to that area without injuring any of the flexor tendons, without injuring uh, your median nerve or the branches. Uh, from the median nerve going to the thumb. For the mid palmar space, again, the reason we need to do these, we need to decompress these in the operating room is you have better control, better visualization, and you're able to um, IND uh, more effectively when the patient is sedated and uh, comfortable. Collar button abscess, when the abscess begins on either the dorsal or the volar side, and then basically coalesce and become uh, abscesses on both sides. You have to make sure that you treat both 
uh, most common on this pinky, on the small finger, on the ulnar border, but it can happen to any of the fingers as you, as I show on this picture. And then specifically, any kind of uh, infection that's in the small finger, if it leads to tenosynovitis, uh, it can communicate to the thumb and vice versa. Any uh, flexor tenovitis of the thumb can communicate to the small finger. Uh, I want to just mention briefly about human bites. Uh, one of the things that um, makes human bites a little bit more um, unique than most hand infections is the fact that, number one, you have bacteria from the mouth. And because of the position that the hand is in with the MCP flexed, um, any injury to the extensor tendon, even small, will cause the bacteria to enter under the extensor tendon and potentially infect the MCP joint. And so that's what makes it uh, emergent. These are sometimes associated with a fracture, don't always have to be. And these patients need to be admitted. You can try 24 hours of IV antibiotics, but chances are you'll be taking that patient to the OR within a day or two in order to do a more aggressive and complete washout of the joint. If the joint itself is not cleaned, or irrigated, uh, it will lead to destruction of the cartilage and they will have um, septic arthritis down the line. Even if they don't develop osteomyelitis, they will have uh, basically a, a painful joint, um, which we, we don't want. I just throw this in here, necrotizing fasciitis. Um, most of these injuries happen more in the forearm rather than in the hand, although I did have one patient who, who the entry point was through the hypothenar eminence and it quickly spread into her forearm, um, requiring multiple uh, OR returns in order to uh, be aggressive to cleaning out the infection. Because these spread along the fascial lines, the um, infection is rapid. And even in this day and age, it is still a 25% mortality rate for patients who have an infection, a necrotizing fasciitis of a limb whether it's the upper extremity or lower extremity. And if it, if, if it reaches the torso, it's still a 50% mortality. We're not talking morbidity where they have an amputation of their arm, 25% mortality from an untreated or undertreated necrotizing fasciitis. So it is extremely, extremely um, important to diagnose these rapidly and treat them aggressively. This is an example of a patient who had what seemed like just a cellulitis. However, the cellulitis did not respond to antibiotics. And usually on x-ray, you'll see some air within the, um, the x-ray, which then prompts the referring physician, usually the ER, to send the patient for a CT scan. Um, but if you see air on an x-ray and there was no penetrating trauma that could explain the free air, uh, you have to be very cognizant of the fact that it could be necrotizing fasciitis. So just the, some take-home points at the end. Most common organism for your hand infections are going to be gram-positive just because they're on our dermis all the time, and most of the injuries are from penetrating injuries. Pus under pressure is extremely painful. That's why fel felons are very painful. All pus should be drained, and the shortest distance to the pus, in my opinion, is the best way to drain it. A couple of pearls I've learned over the years, not everything that is painful is bacterial. For example, the herpetic whitlow that we mentioned before. Um, masses that grow slowly and painlessly are either very bad or think mycobacterium. Uh, even simple infections can kill you. Inexpensive antibiotics are usually adequate. You don't have to go crazy with triple different antibiotics unless someone's not responding appropriately to the initial uh, first line defense. And I find that soap and water is truly underrated. I can't tell you how many times patients come in and tell me how they've contorted their bodies in order to not wash their hands after hand infection. After I've told them, please use soap and water, wash your hands, soak it, soak it with either liquid soap and water uh, or betadine in water. Either way, wash it, clean it. Can't be, can't be overstated. 
And then one more thing that I learned from one of my ortho-oncology colleagues, biopsy what you culture and culture what you biopsy. Uh, sometimes things look like an infection and you can get surprised and it turns out that the patient has some kind of fungating met or a um, squamous cell or a basal cell or some kind of osteosarcoma that you were not anticipating. So thank you very much. And then if anybody wants to reach me, um, this is my email. So we're a little ahead of time, but we'll go, no, actually I'm a little bit behind time, sorry. I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Hurst, who is going to talk about Dupuytren's. So let's stop share. Take it away, Dr. Hurst. Uh, I'm here. I'm just making sure I get this thing going properly. One second. Okay. Can everybody see my slides? Yes, yes we see them. Okay. So I'm uh, Larry Hurst. Uh, now I'm professor and vice chair of uh, hand surgery and orthopedics at Stony Brook. And I'm going to talk to you today about Dubitron's disease. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, we did do work with uh, Zyflax, but they've gone bankrupt. Uh, the history of Dupuytren's disease is extremely interesting. Uh, recently, Hanser to Resource produced this uh, history review, which is on YouTube. And if anybody really wants to hear the exciting history of Dupuytren's and really the history of surgery, please uh, check it out on YouTube. Dupuytren's did the first surgery in 1831 and got his name on the disease. He wasn't the first to operate on it. He certainly wasn't the first to visualize it. When we think about Dupuytren's, it's important to understand the dorsal skin is loose and pliable, and the volar skin is firmly attached because of retention ligaments. And these ligaments exist in three planes, longitudinal, transverse, and vertical. They are the source of Dupuytren's contractures. Uh, the cell that starts the problem is the fibrocyte, which de-differentiates into a myofibroblast, producing abnormal amounts of collagen, glyco uh, aminoglycans, and fibronectin, and leading to thickening, shortening of the cord, and the de deformities we see patients present with. When you study this, you start out by knowing the normal uh, anatomy and subsequent abnormal anatomy. The normal fascial bands are Grayson's ligament, the lateral digital sheath, the natatory ligaments, the pretendinous band, and the sagittal bands. The uninvolved structures are Cleland's ligaments and the superficial transverse ligaments of Scoob. Uh, again, here we see the normal ligaments. Note in the, uh, the cross-sectional view, palmarly, we have fibral fatty tissue, which coalesces into parts of central cords. You see Grayson's ligaments, volar to the nerve vascular bundle, the lateral digital sheath, which can become part of the lateral cord, and Cleveland's ligaments, which usually don't involve themselves in pathological cords, but retrovascular bands do. Uh, again, here is the example of the cords that are produced uh, from these bands, the central cord being the most common, seen here on the right, and the nodule is noted. The spiral cord needs special attention and noting. Uh, if you look at this picture on the left, you see the clamp is holding the spiral cord and the neurovascular bundle is going superficial to the cord, spiraling around the cord and then going up into the finger. The result is if you're operating on this and you approach through the skin, the first structure you're gonna to come to is the nerve and therefore it is easily damaged. Dr. Hurst, is there a way to open up your slides so that you don't see two sets of slides, just your, the one that you're presenting? Right now, there's two sets of slides showing up. That's weird. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, I'm only seeing one. Uh, well, let's see. Is it still two or now one? No, still two. That's very weird. Okay. 
I don't know. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, I th I've never run into this problem before. Uh, let's just close a bunch of things and make sure that we got everything closed. It's like it's showing your next slide in addition to your current slide. Uh, all right. Well, maybe we got the wrong. Let's make sure we do this. How about that? No. Still no? Still, still showing two slides. I guess you're going to have to put up with two slides because I, I don't know the. Oh, great. Now it won't advance. Are you still seeing two? Yeah, still seeing two. All right, sorry. Well, I guess we're going to go with two because I can't tell what's wrong. Uh, this disease uh, increases with age uh, and is more common in males than females. Uh, associated diseases such as epilepsy, alcoholism, and diabetes. Uh, those groups of patients have more dubitrons than the normal population for reasons we don't completely understand. The initial stru uh, structures we see in Dupuytren's disease are the nodules. These little lumps are under the skin. They can look like a callus, but they're not. And they are sometimes painful on presentation. The pain usually goes away and sometimes occasionally even the nodule will go away or the nodule can progress to become a cord. Uh, ectopic fibromatoses that are associated with Dupuytren disease are plantar fibromatosis. Uh, Peroni's disease and knuckle pads is seen here. And in the foot, you see plantar fibromatosis. These lesions uh, can be painful when they get big and it's hard to walk on them. Excising them is a problem because you wreck the uh, septi and wreck the sole and sometimes end up with more pain. Uh, occasionally, Dupuytren's presents its nodules at the wrist crease with no other findings. Uh, here we see the first cord. Uh, the cord is not a tendon, it is under the skin, superficial to the flexor tendon, pulls the finger into flexion usually, fourth and fifth fingers most involved, uh, can involve the thumb, index, and the web, but less so than the ulnar digits. Uh, Dr. Houston noted the severity of Dupuytren's and recurrence was worse than those individuals who had a positive family history, who started with the disease at a young age, and who had other plantar or uh, f uh, ectopic fibromatoses. He felt this group had what is now known as the Dupuytren's diathesis. They indeed are a subset of the normal population and are difficult to deal with. Remember, when dealing with Dupuytren's, a little contracture that causes no problem doesn't necessarily need an intervention. You should look for the symptoms, such as difficulty washing the face, holding your beer, etc. Uh, indications for surgery include a positive tabletop test when you cannot place your fingers and your palm in the same flat surface and there's a gap. Contracture-wise, I usually recommended treatment when the MP joint was 20 to 30 degrees flexed and the PIP joint had a 20 degree contracture that was known to be worsening. A slight isolated PIP contracture that doesn't worsen may not need intervention. Here's a classic central cord and the excised Dupuytren's material. Uh, McFarlane in a uh, old study showed that a uh, very small group actually got perfect results and some group, some part of the group as much of a quarter actually got worse. So surgery works, but it does have its limitations. There are gazillions of incisions that have been described for this. The hole you make in the skin doesn't guarantee what happens when you get the fascia out. And as long as you keep the skin from contracting and dying, the incision type isn't really too critical. The common ones used today are two versions of the Z Z -plast or zigzag plasty or Bruner incisions, a longitudinal incision which is turned into a Bruner by Z plasty or transverse incisions which were championed by McCash. Here's an example of a Bruner incision exposing the central cord and the scoog ligaments. Uh, allowing good exposure uh, to remove the cord while protecting the neurovascular structures. Uh, again, you see here 
uh, distally by the MP joints, the cord uh, is easily separated from the other cords and under the neurovascular bundles remain under Skoog's ligament, whereas proximally the cords coalesce and are more, a little more difficult to dissect at the level of the superficial arch. Uh, here we see it being removed uh, again in a central cord case. When you're designing incisions, I like to release the cord proximally uh, before completing the design distally because in really bad contractures, what you thought was a nice zigzag incision may turn rather straight when you straighten the finger after releasing the MP contracture in the palm. Some people try to preserve the transverse ligaments. Uh, I felt that releasing them and exposing the neurovascular bundles so I can follow the neurovascular bundles distally and protect them was useful. Uh, but that's what you're seeing here is the transverse ligaments under the clamp or over the clamp. Again, emphasizing the uh, spiral cord, what spirals is the neurovascular bundle, not the cord, brings the neurovascular bundle proximal, central, and superficially. This is a highly tested concept, uh, and it is important when doing surgery. This uh, superficial location of the neurovascular bundle is usually just about at the level of the uh, first transverse finger crease. Uh, here you see uh, a cartoon with the neurovascular bundle uh, seen there radially. Here's the spiral nerve ulnarly. Here's where the cord would be located, and there's the flexor tendon. These cords come in combinations. Here you see a fifth finger central cord in combination with a natatory cord going over the ring finger, produces a so-called Y cord combination, uh, which can be treated uh, either surgically or with needle apronotomy or Zoflex. PIP contractures do occur. Isolated PIP contractures aren't too common, about 15%. Most of them come in combination with MP joint contracture related to central cord, which crosses both joints. Keep in mind when dealing with PIP contractures that the joint can be bent because it's arthritic, uh, because the central slip is attenuated, the lateral bands are subluxed, the collaterals and volar plate are contracted, or even a tight flexor tendon sheath. PIP joints are extremely difficult to fully correct and even more difficult to keep fully corrected. When dealing with the uh, uh, fifth finger, keep in mind that there's actually two sensory nerves there of importance, the dorsal ulnar sensory nerve and the ulnar neurovascular bundle. The ulnar neurovascular bundle will become spiraled around the so-called abductor digiti minimi cord. And when dissecting this, you have to keep in mind both the spiraling of the neurovascular bundle and the presence of the dorsal nerve. Uh, here you see the Grayson's ligaments of the fifth finger being uh, dissected to expose the neurovascular bundle before going after the abductor digiti minimi cord. Uh, in this photo, you see the neurovascular bundle, the abductor digiti minimi cord, and the dorsal nerve. On the right-hand side, we see an example of a lateral cord, which is contracting the DIP joint. Usually, the neurovascular bundle stays uh, central to these lateral cords, as you see here uh, in the photo. When you finish dissecting uh, the fascia out, always let down the tourniquet, check the viability of the flaps, and check for bleeding. Uh, we do not want a hematoma. On the other hand, be very cautious with your bipolar cautery uh, because the digital arteries are tiny and it's easy to uh, cause uh, disruption of the blood supply if you're too aggressive with your quarter. This is the open palm McCash technique. He was from Ireland. Uh, he used this transverse incisions to remove the cords and left the wounds open and claimed in four to six weeks, everybody healed up fine. The reason for his uh, transverse incisions left open was to avoid skin grafts and older people where he wanted them to move right away and not get uh, contractures. Uh, it does work. It's difficult to uh, operate under the transverse flap, as you see there under the blue circle. And that's where the spiral cords occur. So it can be uh, a more complex uh, dissection uh, that you have to be very cautious with. But it does work. It does allow immediate motion. 
and they do heal up, but they usually take a bit longer than advertised. Uh, the radial side of the hand is less involved, but you will see commissural cords as seen here and radial cords. The x-ray shows a wire taped to the cords and how the cords relate to the underlying skeleton. And the view with the green dots shows where to place your Zyflex if you're going to treat this with uh, that type of uh, injection. Here's a surgical case. Uh, the, the commissural cord is uh, demonstrated, radial cord is demonstrated. Understand that the nerve to the radial side of the index finger is at risk here. The ulnar and radial nerve to the thumb is at risk. And they're, uh, all three are quite superficial, so cautious dissection, trying to identify the nerve vascular structures uh, before you uh, aggressively remove the cord material. And often the, uh, the web will have to be z plastied in order to prevent the contracture of the web from the surgical incision. Skin grafts are helpful. Uh, this one was being used for a thumb. You can see an old graft was used for previous surgery on the fourth and fifth fingers. They help deter recurrence. They don't stop it completely, uh, but they can be a useful uh, addition to your armamentarium when dealing with these uh, by surgical intervention. Here's an example of a knuckle pad. This is sort of an example of what not to do. Uh, knuckle pads that don't hurt and aren't too large are best left alone. Uh, they are completely adherent to the extensor tendon. There's no uh, easy plane between the tendon and the nodule. And if you're not careful, you will excise the extensor tendon and cause a boutonniere deformity. So excision only if they're very painful or very large or both. This can be treated by closed fasciotomy. This was done around the time of World War II. Most people gave this up because of neurovascular injury. Uh, this has been replaced by doing uh, needle uh, aponeurotomies where a small needle is placed through the skin into the cord numerous times until the cord is disrupted. Uh, people who are well-trained in this have successful results. The uh, recurrence is high. When all else fails, some uh, salvage procedures are fusing of the PIP joint, a prosthesis of the PIP joint, and an amputation. In about 30 years of 40 years of hand surgery, I did one amputation, no prostheses, and maybe a half dozen arthrodeses. The arthrodesis does work to get the finger out of the way and doesn't uh, allow recurrent contracture of that joint. Uh, complications include hematoma, infection, skin loss, nerve injury, vascular damage, and uh, complex regional pain syndrome. And outcomes are variable. Collagenase came in after our articles in uh, uh, 2010. Here you see a cartoon of an injection of a central cord Go ahead. and manipulation. Dr. Hurst is going to break the cord. There you go. Uh, it does work. Recurrence is clearly a problem. When doing this, you identify the cord carefully. Uh, you palpate. You find the place where the cord is bow strung away from the flexor tendons. That's where you place the injection of about 0.58 milligrams of the drug. It can be spread out along the cord. You can use two doses at a time now. So if you use a little extra uh, collagenase that was in the bottle, that's okay. Uh, and this helps just uh, weaken the bonds in the collagen and allows the uh, manipulation that you saw done uh, a day or two later after the injection. When injecting, the needle must be placed in the center of the cord, stabilize the barrel before pushing the plunger. You want the material in the cord, not in the subcutaneous tissue and not in the flexor tendon. Manipulation, I tried to do it in four steps really. Uh, Hyperextend the MP joint with the PIP flexed. Uh, Hyperextend the PIP joint with the MP flexed. Extend both joints and then with the joints all extended, push on the cord and see what else I could pop with my uh, palpating thumb or finger. Uh, results showed uh, in our cases, we had 50% with nodules that just got observation, 46% got collagenase, five still had surgery. Uh, surgeries that I did included nodule excision, nodule with trigger release, fasciectomy of the palm and digits, 
fasciectomy and split thickness skin graft, occasionally fasciectomy with carpal tunnel syndrome, and occasionally using digit widget with various uh, other modalities. Carpal tunnel and fasciectomy for a time were thought to be a no-no, but subsequent work has shown that you can do these two procedures without ruining the results of either one. 80% uh, involved multiple digits. Recurrence after collagenase in our experience was about 10%. Recurrence post-surgery was 15%. The bottom line is you can't cure this. Here's an example of uh, a central cord. Uh, the natatory cord combining with the central cord to make the Y cord, two natatory cords with the central cord making a so-called crow foot cord and the web cords. And then you'll find various complex combinations. Here's an example of a central cord, uh, nice picture of it, palpation, figure in your brain, where exactly is the cord? Where is the flexor tendon? Identify the target, localize where you're going to put your collagenase. All right, make it faster. And here's the result two okay. weeks later. Splinting is used. Uh, this is historically uh, something we always did. There's not very many studies about this. Probably splinting of MP contractures is not very necessary. PIP contractures probably benefit. And again, occasionally I use the digit widget in conjunction with either surgery or collagenase. Uh, for MP uh, contractures treated with collagenase, we got 44%, 44 degrees improvement, 92% got straight. PIPs do worse, regardless of the treatment option you choose. Uh, skin tears occur in about 15% with collagenase, but heal quickly. They're not really a problem. Other side effects of collagenase include itching, ecchymosis, no severe allergic reaction, no nerve injuries. Tendon injuries do occur. Fortunately, they're very rare. It has now been shown that you can safely give collagenase when people on Coumadin. Uh, however, the ecchymosis you see there on the left is extremely scary to you and the patient. However, three weeks later, it does resolve. Uh, recurrence, recurrence, recurrence. No matter what choose you choose, Zyaflex or surgery or needle, that's the problem that's not uh, resolved. Some of the rules of Dubatron's disease to keep in mind are it can't be cured. It's not a fatal disease. Remember, if there's really no symptoms and minimal functional problems, it may be appropriate to just observe. Recurrence happens, it's not predictable. Patients generally like to avoid surgery, but sometimes that's the best alternative. Remember that the patient who can't make a fist is more unhappy than those who can't straighten their fingers. Uh, before needle and before Zyaflex, aggressive surgery sometimes resulted in people who had straight fingers but no capacity to grip. Also remember the rusty hinge theory, stiff PIP joints that cannot flex uh, because of trouble with the joint are not going to be flexing just because you remove the Dupatron's cord. You have to undertake these patients with the idea that you're going to be at their side for a long time. It's a lifelong disease and uh, it's common to have to help the patient on more than one occasion. Additional information is available in multiple uh, publications and books. Uh, you can see a good chapter in it about it in our uh, hand surgery resource app, hand surgery source, and on the hand surgery source portion of our website. Uh, also, um, myself and our PhD team are writing a book on Dupatron's disease and the science of Dupatron's disease, which will be available next year. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry you saw two versions of the thing side by side. I couldn't figure out how to fix it. Dr. Weber, are we still there? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Hurst. Um, yes. So next will be Lauren, uh, Dr. Lauren Grossman. Uh, discussing tenosynovitis. And Dr. Hurst, sorry to put you on the spot, but someone asked whether your lecture could be recorded. And if you can provide that to us, we'll add it to our, our list of pre-recorded slides. Uh, I will do that. Um, just so, for information, uh, again, there's lots of information on Answer Tree Resource. Uh, the Hand Society's uh, uh, 
series of 50 lectures. My lecture is one of those 50, so you can see it on the Insurgery site already. And I'll try to get it to you to put up on the New York site. Thank you so much. Okay, so Dr. Hurst, you need to um, unshare your screen so that Dr. Grossman can share hers. Did I get it, Dr. Weber? I think so. Okay. Yes. Now Dr. Grossman's logging on. Perfect. Take it away, Lauren. And unmute yourself. Hi, um, I'm going to be speaking to you about tenosynovitis of the upper extremity. Um, because it's a review of course, I'm going to go through some questions that pertain to these tenosynovitis um, in order for the testing purposes. Okay. So I'll be going over trigger digits, decorvanes, tenosynovitis, intersection syndrome, FCR tendinopathy, ECU tendinopathy, and EPL tendinopathies. Starting off with uh, trigger digits, it's a disproportion between the volume of the flexor sheath and its contents. We can see here on the bottom right, a phalanx and the fibrosseous tunnel of the A1 pulley. So which fibroosseous digital pulley is involved typically in the pathophysiology of a trigger finger? The A1 pulley. So the most common digits involved are the thumb, ring, and long fingers. Usually it's a nodular tendon enlargement at the A1 pulley, but there are other etiologies that can occur, such as rheumatoid tenosynovitis, causing inflammation around the tendons, triggering partial tendon injuries, which can present as a trigger finger, um, a partial cut, um, while the patient can flex and extend certain joints, the finger may um, trigger and the history of a laceration should make you think of this. Um, MP joint and PIP joint deformities. So here on the right, we see the pulley system. The most proximal is the A1 pulley. And then on the left, we see a dissection of the seam. So what is the length of the A1 pulley? It seems pretty asinine, but they ask you this question, seven to 10 millimeters. Into what structure does the A1 pulley insert? And that would be the MP joint fuller plate. So treatment for trigger fingers. First, you wanna consider what stage the trigger finger is at. If you have a patient with a locked finger and has very difficulty extending it, probably considering injections may not necessarily be fruitful. Um, comorbidities, patients who have diabetes have a higher prevalence of trigger fingers compared to the general population. And then also knowing about inflammatory conditions such as RA as to what might help this patient. So uh, studies have shown that therapy splinting NSAIDs uh, really have not been helpful uh, some therapists really swear by these MP joint splinting, um, haven't really seen uh, many results with this that are overly helpful. Um, steroid injections have shown relief of symptoms for at least about 57% or so, um, but at a year, there are some that do recur. Uh, it did not seem to decrease the rate of surgery in diabetes patients, um, and most important of this is that uh, an intra sheath injection is really not much better than an extra sheath in uh, injection. The steroids tend to work similarly. So trigger finger releases, some pearls that are important to really keep in your head is make sure that you have the correct diagnosis going in to do a trigger finger release. When a patient has a different problem, 
uh, even though it presents similarly, tends uh, will not obviously help the problem. So a lot of times patients will come in saying, my finger's locking, it's clicking on me, it won't, it won't, can't straighten it out. It looks as though you have a trigger finger, but a lot of times extensor tendon dysfunctions tend to uh, present similarly, where you have a uh, injury to the sagittal band on the radial aspect, and the tendon subluxes into the ulnar gutter over the MP joint, and it looks very similar to a trigger finger. Other flexor anomalies, joint synovitis, instability, and other sites of triggering. Here is a, a diagram or tendon showing sagittal band injury. Again, radial sagittal band injury can cause subluxation of the tendon into the ulnar gutter. Here we see on the right side, we see some nodules at the area of flexor uh, tendons, which is causing those tendons to trigger, but this is a reason uh, a different site of triggering. So again, if you were to see this patient um, and see the finger triggers, you just want to make sure that there is no other evidence or abnormalities on your exam before moving forward with a standard trigger finger release. So there are different ways to perform releases. Some people do percutaneous releases um, and you could uh, do this using a needle. Um, the main concerns with the trigger finger release are the complications or the percutaneous or the complications which are incomplete releases and then superficial tendon and digital nerve injuries. Uh, many people do it and are quite successful with this. Uh, performing an open release, uh, you wanna make sure that you minimize your soft tissue planes and you protect your neurovascular bundles. Uh, the Palmer op Neurosis also can cause a pulley and you, that is a site of triggering. So you want to make sure that you release that as well. Um, and if needed, you can also resect an ulnar slip of the FTS tendon. In performing a trigger thumb release, you wanna make sure that you're protecting the radial digital nerve, both nerves, but the radial digital nerve crosses over in that area. So you wanna make sure you see, you protect and you retract. And then you also wanna make sure you're releasing the A1 pulley uh, and and you are preserving the oblique fully, A1 fully, and the oblique fully, very important uh, to me. Acrovane's tenus synovitis is also a very common uh, problem. Uh, it tends to be known as the new mom's disease, but many other patients get it. Um, it is a stenosing tenus synovitis at the first dorsal extensor compartment. You have the EPB and the APL in the first compartment. Um, the APL has two or more slips sometimes and can be uh, one of the issues. And the EPB tends to be a more common site of compression most of the time because it ends up being in a separate subcompartment. Uh, the sheath becomes traumatic or narrowed and causes pain and inflammation. So typically, how many EPB tendon slips would you expect to find at surgical exploration during a deep veins release? Again, as we went over, the APL is the one that tends to have two or more slips. The EPB only has one. So here we see a picture of uh, the first dorsal extensor compartment, um, and that's the area of the release. So pertinent anatomy for decrovanes in again, the APL is more palmar and radial to the EPB. It has one or more slips, and then their accessory insertion. And the EPB typically has one slip, but 30% has its own subcompartment, but in deep ravines, 70% of patients end up having a separate subcompartment. Here is a picture of the release, and the release is on the dorsal aspect of the first compartment. And here is a picture showing a subsheath for the EPB tendon. So it's important to uh, have an appropriate history that tends to really help make your diagnosis. You check your point of maximal tenderness, which is at the first compartment doing a Finkelstein's test. Here we have an Eikhoff's test, which most people are calling the Finkelstein's test, where the thumb is held in the palm, the examiner radially deviates the wrist. The Finkelstein's test is holding on the thumb and then radially deviating the wrist, all, both causing similar areas of pain. The Finkelstein test tends to be a little bit gentler, not as painful. 
Brunelli test is also regular abducting the thumb. A lot of patients might say have difficulty doing this and performing this test is also quite helpful. Differential diagnosis includes intersection syndrome which tends to be more proximal and dorsal to uh, the first dorsal extensor compartments. Other differential diagnoses are uh, cervical radiculopathy, uh, radial nerve injury, and here we can see a nice picture that the radial nerve basically directly overlies the first dorsal extensor compartment. Um, important anatomy question, the superficial branch of the radial nerve emerges at what interval? ECRL, ECRB. Here we see uh, a brachioradialis on the top and the ECRL on the bottom. And there is the branch of the nerve that comes in between. Important to make sure that you protect it. This is a little bit more proximal, but again, it can be an area of compression. Uh, Mortenberg syndrome, again, you can, uh, it's compression of this, the nerve causing uh, pain uh, going distal to the hands. Other uh, diagnoses, you've got basal joint arthritis, STT arthritis, radiocarpal arthritis, all can present similarly as it's on the radial aspect of the wrist. There are scaphoid fractures, scaphoid nonunions, giant cell tumors of the radius. So treatment considerations are patient education, letting them know what's going on, why it's happening, um, and how they can perform activity modifications. Sometimes that works and sometimes not. There's home program and therapy uh, works for a minimal amount of people, uh, but there are some patients who really want to try some therapy before doing anything else. And then there are therapeutic modalities. We have evidence that really bracing tends to uh, not help many patients, helps 30% of patients. Third injections have been helpful, has uh, helped about 62% of patients. There are some patients that only need one, one that can need a few, but you wanna make sure you limit to two to three injections as it can cause injury to the tendon uh, before more, and then there are risks of the injection. So the risks of the injection can be deep pigmentation as we see on the right side of the screen. You see that the skin has changed colors. There's that necrosis, which causes uh, some flattening underneath uh, the skin, uh, tissue atrophy, diabetics, it can increase blood glucose for five to six days after the injection, and then corticosteroid flare. Um, here is a picture of uh, surgical decompression. Sometimes you may want to perform a tenosynovectomy as well. Once you open it up, sometimes there tends to be a significant amount of tenosynovitis around the tendons, and that's good uh, when performing the surgery, you want to minimize your risk to the superficial branch of the radial sen sensory nerve, as we saw it went directly over the area. So you want to spread longitudinally, retract, and make sure that it's out of the way uh, before moving forward with your release. Um, you want to perform a um, incision over the dorsal retinaculum over the EPB in order to provide a shelf uh, for the tendons to minimize subluxation of the tendons. Uh, you also want to make sure there is not a subcompartment for the EPB tendon. If there is, you release the subcompartment as well and sometimes remove the septum and then you confirm the tendon stability. Here again, we see different branches of the radial sensory nerve directly over the first compartment. Next is uh, intersection syndrome. Uh, they tend to happen more, uh, it's more dorsal and more proximal. It happens with flexion and extension of the wrist. And a lot of times you may hear or feel crepitus. Again, the yellow circle is the first compartment, whereas blue is the second. And the second is where you would see intersection syndrome. You tend to see pain and swelling due to the entrapment second compartment, it used to be thought that it was from the crossing over of the first to the second compartment, but it's really just entrapment of the second compartments. Again, the location is where the first compartment crosses, um, but it's really secondary to the entrapment of the second compartments. It tends to be seen in rowers and weightlifters. 
Again, diagnosis, tenderness palpation, again, making sure that that area is more proximal and dorsal to the first compartment, so it's not confused with the two. Tend to have pain with wrist extension and flexion, crepitus. You can perform, uh, a lot of times splinting is helpful. If splinting doesn't work, steroid injections can help as well. And then finally, if those don't help, there is uh, surgery, which you perform a longitudinal incision to release the second compartment and leaving the retinaculum open. Next, moving on to FCR tendinopathy. It's significantly more common than you might think. Um, it's pretty underappreciated and often it is a chronic uh, problem, chronic diagnosis. Uh, differential diagnoses tend to perform an anatomic, uh, cause an anatomic challenge. So with the FCR anatomy, it's redirected um, at the volar wrist towards the insertion at the base of the second metacarpal. And it goes through the trapezial tunnel um, as we see here on the right. Um, diagnosis is again, subjective in, uh, history, pain on the volar, radial aspect of the wrist, pain gripping, lifting things, clinical examination um, is helpful. And then a lot of times performing an injection can be diagnostic and sometimes therapeutic and imaging is helpful as well. So which, what radiographic finding is associated commonly with an FCR tendinopathy? So as we saw, it went through the area of the trapezium and we see STT arthritis where there are osteophytes that can increase your risk of FCR tendinopathy. Here we have imaging of x-ray, you see mild STT arthritis on the MRI here. You also see this STT arthritis, which is significantly more evident. On the MRI also here, we see volar radial aspect. The arrow is pointing to the FCR, which has inflammation around the tendon differences in that tendon compared to the rest of the tendons. So non-surgical treatment, again, patient education, activity modification, splinting, sometimes therapy and rehab, um, and then maybe a steroid injection. Um, I have found that it's helped some patients. Sometimes it comes right back, um, but it also could be helpful in diagno diagnosing the patient, um, performing your release want to make sure that you protect um, the parvocutaneous branch of the median nerve. We see here on the right side of the screen an image where the hook is holding the FCR radially. You have the, the superficial branch of the uh, median nerve, and then you also see the median nerve as well. Um, you perform a tenectomy. You can release sometimes a subsheath and then the tunnel, which is distally that uh, fibrosis tunnel you see it right over here. And then if it's a really severe case, it's not, I mean, it can also be performed. Next is ECU tendinopathy. ECU tendinopathy can uh, be um, sometimes difficult to diagnose as it's only that at risk, which is a whole. Uh, black box of some difficult diagnoses. Um, it's a sixth dorsal compartment and it goes through a fiber osseous tunnel. Um, and again, ulnar sided wrist pain, PFCC problems, J problems, and so forth. In the diagnosis, you have localized tenderness on the ulnar aspect of the wrist, a lot of times at the base of the fifth metacarpal where it attaches. Sometimes it uh, causes pain that goes more proximally by the head of the ulna and even more proximally. An ECU synergy test, um, which is testing uh, the strain in that area that causes pain directly at the area of the ECU. Check for tendon stability. Sometimes the ECU sublux uh, over the ECU, uh, excuse me, over the ulnar head. And then imaging is also helpful. So with the synergy test, Okay, that video doesn't work, sorry. So um, imagine in your head, you, uh, the examiner uh, places the patient's table on uh, the hand on the table, you flex the elbow at 90 degrees, so the hand is in the air. Your forearm is in full supination, and then the examiner will resist the thumb abduction with the counter force on the long finger of the patient, which then produces pain at the ECU. Again, differential diagnosis, TFCC pathology, which they're intertwined, a lot of them both at the time they come together, DRUJ pathology, 
um, LT, mid-carpal uh, problems, and sometimes piezoetrefractal OA, which sometimes is a bit more molar. And here we see an MRI, you see inflammation again around the EC tendon, um, and that is indicative. So non-surgical treatment, once again, I know I sound like a broken record, patient education, activity modification, splinting, therapy sometimes helps, sometimes injections are also helpful for patients. Um, when performing surgery, you make an incision along the radial aspect of the compartment to minimize subluxation of the tendon. Um, afterwards, you perform a tendon debridement, a uh, retinacular repair, and if you tendon stabilization, minimize subluxation or dislocation of the tendon ulnarly. Um, and finally, we have EPL tendonitis. This tendon entrapment usually is rarely seen. The majority of the time, you see these patients after the EPL is already ruptured. Um, most of the time, this is associated with some sort of risk trauma, such as a non displaced radius fracture, sometimes an inflammatory arthropathy, um, which causes um, stenosis around the area of the tendon. Um, these problems tend to lead to attritional rupture, but if prior to rupture, you're able to catch it, performing a release and subcutaneous transposition can be preventative to minimize that risk of rupture. Um, patients complain of pain over the area of the EPL um, most of the time as it crosses over on the wrist by the third compartment. Patients have pain with extension of the thumb off of the table and they, uh, against resistance and have pain in the wrist with that tendonitis. Um, MRIs uh, will show sometimes, like all the others, uh, inflammation around the tendons, uh, signaling. Um, if it ends up rupturing, uh, then you need to perform a, a reconstruction versus any sort of repair, then it would be IP UPL tenant transfer. Um, again, uh, checking for a rupture, uh, we see here on the right, there's full extension of the thumb. On the left, you see the thumb is flexed um, and unable to extend. The best test really to check for the EPL rupture is actually having the patient place their hand flatly on the table and extending the thumb from the table. And that really gives you um, a diagnosis of a rupture. Um, and again, ideally you catch that rupture or uh, you catch it before the rupture if possible um, based on patient symptoms. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter is Dr. Gilbert discussing compression neuropathy. We are running about 10 minutes behind, um, but hopefully we'll, we'll make up for that. And again, questions, there are, are some questions from the audience and we'll be covering those at, uh, at the end of this session at 12.45, 12.50, uh, whenever we finish. Thank you. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. I'm gonna go through compression neuropathy. Um, it's a lot to go through. I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, go through this on time. Remember, this will be loaded up on the website. So we'll start with carpal tunnel syndrome, certainly the most common uh, compression neuropathy that we see. And you certainly wanna know the anatomy of the median nerve. And uh, in addition, the anatomy of the carpal tunnel. Remember, and I'll somewhat gauge this towards some questions that can be asked on the OIT. Um, the FPL is within the uh, carpal tunnel and the FCR is not. And obviously the median nerve is, that's what results in carpal tunnel syndrome. You also want to know variations uh, of the median nerve. In general, the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve originates five centimeters proximal to the wrist flexion crease. Usually this is not an issue when you're dealing with um, uh, carpal tunnel release. It is, as uh, was discussed uh, by Dr. Grossman, as well as when we're uh, approaching a distal radius fracture volarly. More, more, more pertinent to a um, carpal tunnel release is the recurrent motor branch. And uh, there's some good, uh, an, an excellent study by Lance, an anatomic study, which showed the variability. And the majority of, of the uh, recurrent motor branches comes, come off uh, radially and distally to the transverse carpal ligament. So when we release the transverse carpal ligament, we want to release it along its ulnar margin to prevent injury to the recurrent motor branch. 
So what causes carpal tunnel syndrome? Well, anything that causes an increase in carpal tunnel pressure can result in carpal tunnel syndrome. Most often it's idiopathic. In general, we see these in patients who are elderly, uh, females more, than, uh, more commonly than males. And certainly we know that there are certain medical conditions that predispose patients toward developing this. Uh, most commonly is diabetes and hypothyroidism. So you do want to get a good history just so you know what is um, the etiology. Um, pregnancy can result in carpal tunnel syndrome as well because of the increased uh, retained uh, fluid resulting in tenosynovitis. You can also develop uh, an, an acute carpal tunnel syndrome from either distal radius fracture or forearm compartment syndrome tight dressings, et cetera. And, and these are medical emergencies. So how do you diagnose carpal tunnel syndrome? Well, there are many ways, but in, in my opinion, I think the majority of patients can be uh, diagnosed based upon the history itself. Patients have complaints of numbness and tingling in their hand. Oftentimes they describe that they need to wring out the hand to bring circulation. They, they think it's a circulatory problem, but as we know, it's, it's not, it's a neurologic condition. And anything that, that keeps the wrist flexed uh, prolonged times or repetitively, such as sleeping at night when we keep our wrist flexed or driving, reading a book, et cetera, increases the pressure of the median nerve within the carpal tunnel, and this can result in symptoms. So you want to do a good sensory exam. Um, we all know the distribution of the median nerve. Um, and the important thing is, is, is really just touching it is, is not so... Touching the finger is not a very good way of really diagnosing carpal tunnel syndrome, at least in its early stages. By the time a patient loses sensitivity, um, it, this is probably advanced carpal tunnel syndrome. Innervation density tests are relatively insensitive. Threshold tests such as Sems Weinstein and vibrometry are much more sensitive. We in general do not do these in our office. These are more often done by our uh, CHT colleagues or in studies, but let's keep this in mind. You want to examine the hand. You want to look for thinner atrophy as well as weakness. Again, these are late stages of carpal tunnel syndrome. And then there are provocative tests. There's the Tunnel sign where you tap along the median nerve uh, just at or proximal to the uh, carpal tunnel. The Phalen's test uh, depicted here where you have the patient flex the wrist for anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds. And this increases the pressure within the carpal tunnel uh, resulting in symptoms. The Durkin's compression test, which as you see is a much more accurate test where you basically compress the median nerve at or proximal to the wrist flexion crease resulting in symptoms. And my sort of go-to test is a wrist flexion carpal compression test, which is the most specific test. And it's essentially a combination of the Phelan's and Durkin's tests. Um, and, and this is a pretty good test. And, and these exams you can do within a minute or two and have a pretty good idea of what's going on. A little bit on electromyography. Um, I, I think to some extent it is falling out of favor, although it still is the gold standard. Um, it's operator dependent. It's important to know that negative tests do not necessarily mean that disease is absent. Anywhere up to 20% of patients who have carpal tunnel syndrome may have normal or equivocal EMGs, and it has not been shown to correlate with outcome to treatment. And in fact, EMGs generally don't normalize even after successful decompression. Ultrasound is beginning to somewhat supplant um, EMGs. There are many advantages. It's much less expensive. It's quick. It's non-invasive. Patients are comfortable, and EMG is not a comfortable test. And you get immediate results. And you can also diagnose other concomitant um, etiologies for the carpal tunnel syndrome present, such as tenosynovitis and ganglia. A good diagnostic parameter to remember is if you have a median nerve cross-sectional area greater than or equal to 10 millimeters squared at the wrist flexion crease or at the level of the pisiform, um, this is diagnostic of carpal tunnel syndrome. Certainly have been some studies recently showing a higher sensitivity and specificity than even um, EMGs. It is somewhat operator dependent. Uh, there are many hand surgeons who are comfortable performing this test in their office. And you do not need to send the patient for EMGs, but um, certainly EMGs are still something that are a, a test that is commonly ordered. So how do we treat carpal tunnel syndrome? Well, um, certainly you want to know the underlying diagnosis. And if necessary, have the patient be treated for the underlying diagnosis. If the symptoms are mild, uh, you can treat them initially with splinting. So patient has mostly symptoms at night. 
Um, in most patients, this does not lead to long-term relief of their symptoms. Steroid injections do help the symptoms in the majority of patients, but it really depends upon the extent of the carpal tunnel syndrome, and only about one in five patients gets long-term relief. But particularly, um, I like a steroid injection, one, for patients with mild symptoms, or two, to judge their response to surgery. So if you have a patient who has, let's say, a, a cervical radiculopathy as well as carpal tunnel syndrome, and you're not certain which way to go in terms of treatment, their response to a cortisone injection is relatively predictive of um, their response to surgery. And certainly, you'll have a happier patient who is going to undergo a carpal tunnel release as opposed to go for cervical fusion and not have relief of their symptoms knowing that they should have just had their carpal tunnel released. And medications, they've been, been studied exhaustively. We really have no proven benefit over placebo, particularly vitamin B6, which uh, there used to be some literature uh, supporting this. I still see many patients who get this prescribed, particularly by neurologists, and um, there's really no use. If it is, it's a placebo effect. So surgery, Options are open release. You can do a mini open release or an endoscopic release. One thing to remember is that both techniques are essentially equivalent at three months. Um, it's, a, it's an earlier return to work and an earlier recovery for endoscopic, but really it's just based upon your, your training and um, what you're comfortable with. Um, it, I would say in the, in the 90s, there was some literature showing that there were a higher complication rate with the endoscopic technique, particularly uh, iatrogenic nerve or vessel injury. And most studies over the past 20 years have shown that this is not really true. A couple of things to remember, routine antibiotics are not indicated for open carpal tunnel release as well as most soft tissue uh, procedures. Um, splinting is not really necessary and OT in most patients is not necessary. So I'll throw in a couple of questions that uh, came out from recent OITS. Um, which physical examination finding among patients with carpal tunnel syndrome has the highest specificity? Well, the wrist flexion carpal compression test, as we discussed earlier. What is the most common pattern of branching of the thenar motor branch of the median nerve at the level of transverse carpal ligament? Again, um, the anatomic study by Lance. It's extra ligamentous, most commonly comes distally and radially to the distal aspect of the transverse carpal ligament. An otherwise healthy 42-year-old woman is scheduled for carpal tunnel release. The Physicians should adhere to routine sterility protocols and do we need antibiotics? No, without local or systemic antibiotics. Okay, on to cubital tunnel syndrome, which is the second most common upper extremity um, compression neuropathy. Uh, these patients uh, present with numbness and tingling along the ulnar nerve distribution, the ulnar one and a half digits, as depicted in this lower um, left-hand uh, picture. Uh, in more advanced cases, patients can have uh, intrinsic atrophy. And remember, the ulnar nerve provides the majority of the intrinsic strength and muscles within the hand. So much more so than carpal tunnel syndrome, carpal, the, the median nerve only innervates the thenar muscles. So these patients in late stages will have um, much worse symptoms in terms of hand function. Late stages, you can see clawing, and obviously you don't want the patient to get to this point. Examination, a lot of these exams are very similar to what we do um, on the median nerve. You can tap over the nerve uh, to nail sign, you can compress the nerve, uh, and you can also have the patient flex the elbow and this stretches the nerve, decreasing the vascularity of the nerve. And this results in symptoms of numbness and tingling along the ulnar nerve distribution. You should certainly examine the stability of the ulnar nerve. This is particularly important if a patient is undergoing surgery because if they have an unstable nerve, um, then uh, you will likely require, um, need to uh, transpose the nerve. Um, also keep in mind though, that th there is certainly a subset of patients who have a subluxable ulnar nerve without symptoms of cubital tunnel syndrome. So just because they have a subluxable ulnar nerve does not necessarily mean that they will have symptoms of cubital tunnel syndrome. I'll quickly go through this, but basically these are, are, are tests looking for um, Intrinsic weakness. Um, so sometimes patients have difficulty crossing their fingers. Froman sign. This is a, a, a always fodder for for testing questions. It's secondary to weakness of the adductor pollicis. You can ask the patient to hold something like a piece of paper between their thumb and the radial side of their hand at the web space, and um, you'll try to pull it out. And because of the weakness of the ulnar innervated adductor, they'll flex at the IP joint, compensating with the FPL. 
You can have Wartenberg signs secondary to unopposed EDM uh, pull, as you see on the right here. This should not be confused with Wartenberg syndrome, as was discussed uh, previously. And the papal sign, which is clawing. And obviously, this is a late sign that you do not want to see. So um, I think more important than with carpal tunnel syndrome, you want to keep a differential diagnosis in the back of your mind because cubital tunnel syndrome C5, C, uh, sorry, C81 can be mimicked by cervical radiculopathy or thoracic outlet syndrome, which commonly affects the lower cords. Um, so you want to get a good history and examination. Diagnosis, EMGs are not always positive and notoriously are negative. Uh, particularly in patients who have early stage symptoms. And just because they have a negative EMG does not mean that they do not have disease that requires treatment. I do not always get EMGs on my patients unless, excuse me, um, I need to for some medical legal reason. Um, oftentimes, unfortunately, insurance companies do require EMGs or if I'm worried about concomitant cervical reticulopathy or another site of compression, Ultrasound is emerging as a diagnostic tool, although the parameters um, are not as clearly defined as in carpal tunnel syndrome. Routine x-rays and MRI are not indicated unless there's a history of an injury or trauma. Um, these are the five sites of compression from proximal to distal. Um, uh, they certainly like to ask about the Arcadia struthers. The Arcadia struthers is a fibroaponeurotic um, band of, of tissue. Uh, that goes from the medial intermuscular symptom to the medial head of the tri uh, medial uh, um, triceps, and usually about eight centimeters proximal to the medial epicondyle. Osborne's ligament is another name for the roof of the um, uh, is the roof of cubital tunnel. And I think a good thing to just remember is you want to release the nerve approximately eight centimeters proximal and distal to the medial epicondyle, and you want to keep all these structures in the back of your mind and take care of them. So conservative treatment, you can try splinting, it's poorly tolerated. I tell patients that not all, certainly not all patients require surgery for cubital tunnel syndrome, but there's not a lot to do between uh, doing nothing and, uh, and surgery. Steroid injections, at least in my hands, has not been um, very successful and it's not really um, been shown to be too successful in the literature. There are a lot of procedures that are described. I, I would say over the past 10 years, most hand or upper extremity surgeons have gone to an insight you release. Um, what's important is uh, most studies have demonstrated no superiority of one procedure over the others. And 90% of patients do well no matter what procedures you do if their symptoms are mild. And obviously advantage to an insight you release is that it's a minimally invasive procedure. It's a quicker recovery and fewer complications. So who are not candidates for insight to release? Well, if you have a subluxable ulnar nerve, then you need to transpose the nerve because if you leave it there, it's still gonna be irritated. And if you notice that a patient has a subluxable ulnar nerve before surgery, then you know you're gonna transpose them. But after you release the nerve, you need to check whether or not it's gonna, it's subluxing as well, because if it does after release, then you need to transpose it. Patients who have RA or OA where something immediately may compress the nerve if you're leaving in the cubital tunnel will require transposition of valgus deformity because you'll still have the, the tenting and, and, and um, pull on the, on the nerve should be transposed as well as revision procedure as well as overhead throwing athletes. All of these, you should probably do some type of inside your release. When you're performing this procedure, just remember to protect the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve branches, which are in the area, particularly if you're doing some type of transposition. Uh, a patient with a neuroma of the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve branch is a very unhappy patient. Here's just uh, uh, some pictures that I took from the ASSH, and this is just showing a, a, a submuscular transposition. I do not think there are many surgeons at this point in time that will perform this as a primary procedure, as you see, it's a relatively involved procedure, but uh, it, it certainly is probably the procedure of choice if you're doing a revision. So a couple questions. What is the reason for thumb IP joint flexion with lateral pinch and ulnar nerve palsy? We went over this. It's secondary to un uh, unbalanced flexion torque of the FPL at the IP joint, which is taking over for the weakened adductor pollicis. The presence of an anconeus epitrochlearis muscle is associated with slowing of the conduction velocity of which nerve? 
ulnar. It actually may not be associated with slowing of the conduction velocity, but they're telling you that this is cubital tunnel syndrome. And here's a depiction of um, a um, ankinesia petrochlearis. If you're releasing the ulnar nerve and you see a muscle there, that's what it is, and you need to release it. That's it. And uh, finally, when comparing an insight to ulnar nerve decompression versus anterior transposition, transposition and circle treatment of cubital tunnel syndrome, anterior transposition affords no difference. Doesn't matter what you do. Okay. Um, Guillain's canal compression. These patients also present with numbness and tingling along the ulnar nerve distribution. But remember, the dorsal ulnar sensory nerve branch branches out pro, uh, proximal to Guillain's canal. So you will have normal sensation in this region as opposed to a patient who has cubital tunnel syndrome. These patients can get motor atrophy and weakness and clawing as well. And in late stages, the clawing be, will be worse actually than in cubital tunnel syndrome because your FDA PA of the ring and little fingers, which are innervated more proximally by the ulnar nerve are still intact. So with that intact flexion of these, um, the unimposed flexion by the intact FDP, your clawing will be more severe oftentimes than in cubital tunnel syndrome. Also have to remember that not uncommonly Guillain's canal compression can be secondary to space occupying lesions. So you wanna keep this in the back of your mind. They're listed here. And if necessary, get a diagnostic test. Um, this you can read on your own. Uh, the uh, Guillain's canal compression is, is uh, described in three zones from proximal to distal. The important thing to remember is zone one is proximal to the bifurcation. So you'll have both uh, sensory and motor uh, findings as opposed to zone two, where it's just the motor branch and zone three is a sensory disturbance just from the sensory branch. Diagnosis. Um, in terms of EMGs, I will get uh, EMGs fairly routinely if I think a patient has Guillain's canal compression, because I want to make certain that they uh, do not have a more proximal uh, compression as well, where you need to release the ulnar nerve of the cubital tunnel or some other uh, etiology, such as cervical radical apathy. If you're um, concerned about a space occupying lesion, you should image them with either an MRI or an MR, um, as well as vascular lesions, such as a um, ulnar artery aneurysm. Um, you may want to do some type of diagnostic uh, vascular study. Uh, treatment, again, you can try splinting, activity modification. In terms of surgery, uh, if you have a primarily a compression of the Guillain's canal, you want to release Guillain's canal. Uh, studies have been shown that uh, a carpal tunnel release will indirectly release Guillain's canal because the floor of Guillain's canal is made up from the roof of the transverse carpal ligament, but I think if, if you are certain that they have Guillain's canal compression as well, it, it behooves you to release Guillain's canal as well. And obviously, um, take care of any space occupying lesion. Here's just a picture of a patient who um, had a ulnar artery thrombosis that was uh, compressing the ulnar nerve, and this can be treated. Obviously, you want to try to diagnose this before, do a good Allen's test, and this can either be diagnosed, um, treated um, with ligation, depending upon the Allen test, although I think most people will reconstruct this with a vein graft. A couple quick questions. Uh, which is the following is an anatomical component of the floor of the distal ulnar tunnel or Guillain's canal, as I said before, transverse carpal ligament. And we'll quickly finish up with radial tunnel syndrome. Um, so radial tunnel syndrome is a pain syndrome. It is not a neurologic symptom, syndrome. You do not have neurologic findings. Patients have pain right over this area, um, and it can be confused with lateral epicondylitis, which can coexist. Oftentimes secondary to repetitive tasks, swelling, inflammatory conditions, sometimes from patients with um, rheumatoid or other inflammatory conditions compressing this area. Remember, PIN syndrome is different than radial tunnel syndrome. Radial tunnel syndrome is a purely a pain syndrome. PIN is actually a syndrome where you can com compression of the posterior interosseous nerve and you actually get motor findings. You can get a um, PIN palsy. And this is usually secondary to some type of space occupying lesions. Lipomas have a predilection. Um, it was like to ask um, pay, uh, sometimes a patient with rheumatoid arthritis where they have radiocapotellar synovitis. Diagnosis is generally a diagnos diagnosis based upon examination. Patients have pain in this area. Just remember, this is a relatively painful area. So always examine the contralateral um, form. Don't confuse this with cubital tunnel syndrome. 
pain can be increased with resistant supination. Sometimes patients describe the pain as gnawing, almost like a, a toothache in their form. EMGs are not helpful. Do not get these. They're normal. Again, this is a, a pain syndrome, secondary compression of a nerve, but not a, a compression neuropathy. Conservative treatment can try activity modification, splinting, cortisone injections. I find that the majority of patients with this condition can be treated non-operatively. Um, these are the five sites of compression from proximal to distal. Um, uh, the Arcadia Froche, which is a fibroaponeurotic um, leading edge of the supinator. Um, and these are certainly um, uh, sites that um, are oftentimes uh, questioned uh, on examination. Here's a picture, um, left is proximal, right is distal. Right over here is the posterior interosteous nerve. This is the supinator, this is superficial head of the supinator, and this is the arcadia froche, the leading fibroaponeurotic edge of the supinator. One question, proximal dorsal form pain with supination against resistance, is it finding use of support to diagnosis of radial tunnel syndrome? Thank you. Um, I will stop sharing. And our last but not least lecture is given by Dr. Steve Lee, um, probably the most complicated lecture on um, uh, brachial plexus. Steve is really one of the world's experts on this condition. So we are lucky to have him lecture. Thanks, Rich. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for uh, hanging in there. I know it's a lot of info in this uh, relatively short time, but um, I'm going to try to be, uh, you know, get to the salient points of a very complex topic in 20 minutes. So this is our brachial plexus and reconstruction. Let's see, I'm not advancing it here for some reason here. Okay, there we go. All right, so brachial plexus injuries are devastating, potential source of major disability. They have multiple possible causes. Um, a study back in 2014 showed that mostly male, I think we know this, young, a lot of motorcycles. Uh, half of them are complete, meaning the, the entire extremity, upper extremity is a flail limb. 30% are the upper and 21% upper plus. We'll, we'll get to that. And very uncommonly where um, it's just the hand. A lot of associated injuries, as you can see. I'm trying to take uh, the plexus, which is kind of like a black box from medical school, hopefully not in 1943, uh, to the current uh, OR. Most common mechanism is traction. Um, the very commonly, the uh, patient will fall off a motorcycle, the head hits the ground, the shoulder hits the ground, and there's a massive stretch to the area. Birth palsy, the head comes out, canal, shoulder doesn't come out and uh, there's a stretch, but it's uh, lower energy. Therefore, uh, because of this energy difference in the adult, it's more preganglionic, we'll get to that in a minute, but there's root avulsions, meaning the, the roots are pulled out of the spinal cord, meaning that there's never any possible uh, chance of recovery on its own. Pediatric, more commonly the roots are intact and there's more chance for recovery. Also, a big difference between adults and peds is that it's difficult to reanimate the hand in an adult, not possible for peds. You can get the hand back because it's a shorter distance of uh, uh, regeneration and babies uh, and kids, uh, people under 20 regenerate much faster. Other mechanisms other than traction would be sharp laceration, gunshot wounds. Other things could be masses, tumors, uh, atrogenic. Um, I see this uh, actually unfortunately quite often. Um, when there's uh, shoulder surgery and so forth. Guarding anatomy, I talked about that before, but super important, and this is actually a very common um, kind of question on examinations, is to determine if it's super or infraganglionic. What that means is that if it's super ganglion, it's, it's, it's closer to the brain from the uh, dorsal root ganglion. And uh, if it's uh, the super ganglionic, that is synonymous uh, basically with ripping out of the spinal cord or the, um, the ruptures where the infraganglionic is after the ganglion and uh, it's not a rupture. So very important. And, you know, these terms are kind of strange, like avulsion versus rupture. You can't really tell just by that name. But once again, if it's avulsed, um, then ripped out of spinal cord, you have to, you don't have a live nerve root anymore and you have to bring in uh, accents from somewhere else. And that's via nerve transfer. 
If you just have a stretch here, um, there can be spontaneous recovery. Um, and then if you have the rupture where it's discontinuous, but the um, roots are into the spinal cord still, you could potentially graft that. Regarding evaluation, um, you know, it's, uh, the, the injuries can be very complex and hard to understand, but if you, you can really just kind of uh, whittle it down to a couple of key points. Uh, if somebody calls up and says they had plexus injury, the two, you know, the main things, uh, just with a few questions, you can figure out a lot. One is when did it happen? Because if it happened a long time ago, you can't do nerve surgery, you have to do something else. If, um, and when I say a long time ago, I mean more than a year. Um, if it is um, somebody who can move the shoulder or bend the, or cannot move the shoulder or bend the elbow, but the hand works, you can open and close the hand, that is gonna be a five, six or five, six, seven. Because a five, six, you know, the upper uh, five, six, five, six, seven uh, region that um, innervates the more proximal muscles or the eight, one or more hand type muscles. If the person cannot move anything, shoulder or hand or elbow, then that'd be a complete. And then very rare if the uh, hand doesn't work, but they can bend the elbow and move the shoulder. That is uh, a very rare type. Very important uh, when you examine a patient that uh, you see their entire um, torso and their extremities. Um, so you can uh, look, you have to look at the back, you have to look at the face, we'll go over why that is. But if they have a supraganglionic, they're going to have flail extremity. But you will see, uh, look for wing scapula, weak rhomboids, and horners because those are root level nerves that come out. If it's just infraganglionic and they don't have the other signs, that's um, just a flail arm, then that's infra. So here's a uh, condition. If I had you in a room, I'd be um, quizzing people. But uh, this is Horner syndrome, where there's ptosis or the drooping eyelid constriction of the pupil and anhydrosis. And that's because of paralysis of the sympathetic nerves that come out of CA T1 roots. And uh, those are signs of avulsion. So if you see a Horner's, that's a bad sign. That means CA T1 are avulsed. So you wanna look at their eyes and see. It's poor prognosis for any spontaneous recovery because avulsion, as I just said. Um, myelograms can be done. Uh, now, you know, we're kind of in a transition point where um, high quality, um, MRIs may supplant CT milos. Um, in some places, CT milos are done. Some places, MRIs are done. We still do CT milos, as does the Mayo Clinic. But uh, what you're looking for are these um, traumatic meningocele,s which are signs of root avulsion, because the roots pull out of the spinal cord, the dura rips, and then uh, over time, that dura heals. And then if you do a, a myelogram, say a month later, uh, more dye will fill up into this heel dura that's bigger than usual, and it'll look like that. And those are signs of root avulsion. You can also see on these CT myelograms actually the lack of rootlets. So if you look at that light, left side of the picture, you see these little black lines coming out of the spinal cord. Those are the rootlets. And then if you see on the right side of the screen where that red circle is, you don't see those tiny little rootlets coming out. Those are signs that, um, of avulsion. MRI is good for non traumatic plexopathies like tumors. EMGs are done four to six weeks post injury, and then we do serial EMGs for following uh, for, for uh, recovery um, in that same time frame, four to six weeks, uh, up to three months. Um, what we're looking for are signs of super or infra um, ganglionic denervation, as well as the, the pattern and what's denervated. If you have paravertebral muscles denervated, that's a sign of super ganglionic injury, uh, negative or you know poor prognostic sign, as we discussed. Regarding nerve conduction studies, it's this strange um, paradox in that if the person cannot feel their extremity, but they have a, um, a waveform in the sensory distribution, that's a bad thing. Because if you see that bottom left picture, if you have root um, avulsion, the dorsal root ganglion is still attached to the distal extremity, and you will get a positive waveform when you do a nerve conduction study, but the person can't feel. So it's this paradox. This is actually um, pretty commonly asked in exams. They'll have somebody um, look at this scenario and what they're trying to get at many times in exam questions is a bit super or infraganglionic. They'll show horners or something and they'll show things like this, this nerve induction study and uh, that's leading to the path. They may say, you know, can you graft that root or something? And the answer is you can't do that. Or is this a good sign or bad sign? Things like that. Regarding surgery, uh, the surgery fits into several categories. One is uh, one clump is nerve surgery, which is nerve grafting and transfer. Just doing a neurolysis isn't really, um, that's not enough for true like major plexus uh, injuries. Generally, you're doing nerve grafting, nerve transfer. 
or secondary reconstruction, which are which are done either if the patient presents too late for nerve surgery or they had nerve surgery and it failed. Then you can do other things, potentially nerve tra uh, tendon transfers, free muscle transfers, and fusions. For a standard traction injury, we'll do, as I said, serial examinations, physical examinations, also serial EMGs up to three months. And then the surgery window is generally three to six months. The exception to that is if you knew that somebody had five uh, root level avulsions or the majority root level avulsions right off the bat, there's no reason to wait because there's no spontaneous recovery possible. The reason we wait for three months is that some of these could be neuropraxic and uh, different from what you learn in med school and even maybe residency, neuropraxy is not six weeks to recover, it's three months to recover. So if somebody doesn't have good recovery, like actually moving the extremity, not just twitching of muscles, but actually anti-gravity of muscles by three months, then they'll not have good recovery. So, um, and then if you do surgery after six months, then the outcomes get worse. So that's why there's that golden window between three and six months. If uh, the motor end plates, so the motor end plates and the distal nerve, they fade away after a while. And if you cannot reinnervate those motor end plates by 12 to 18 months, then um, you cannot do nerve surgery. So, um, and you have to, each case is different because it depends on where the level of the injury is, how big the person is. So um, as you may recall, the nerves regenerate about a millimeter a day. And if you just measure it out, you'll see that, um, you know, certain scenarios, uh, it just won't, those minor arm plates won't be around anymore. So you don't do nerve surgery. What are you trying to do? You're trying to uh, assess what they, um, what the major deficits are, what nerves that may receive the um, input, what donor nerves you have. Uh, kind of like tendon transfers, you know, what do you, what are you lacking? What do you, what do you have to give? Um, so nerve um, surgery is the same way. Two most common upper extreme deficits that require treatment would be elbow flexion and shoulder abduction, external rotation, and stability, um, I should say in there. Um, when somebody has a plexus injury and they can't move their shoulder or their elbow, a couple bad things happen, on, in addition to just not being able to use the extremity. But some other things happen that are actually even worse is that the shoulder or the extremity just hangs and it hurts and it actually doesn't feel connected to the body and actually will affect their ambulation. Because just imagine if you have this dead weight hanging on your torso that you can't move and it's not connected to your body, it actually affects everything. So just getting shoulder stability and even a little bit of motion, not even great motion that looks good on a video, but just some stability of the shoulder and some motion is uh, very helpful. Having the elbow bend, uh, you know, if the elbow is just hanging there, you have to wear a sling for the rest of your life. So those are really two things that are key things we try to get back. Other things um, are to stabilize scapula, elbow extension, because if you ever get um, more than 90 degrees of um, abduction to the shoulder, that your hand will just flop down and hit you in the head. Also, if you can um, extend the elbow, you can push down on things and it can be a helping extremity. Later things that you can't always get would be distal things, anything distal to the, um, the elbow, um, such as these. Uh, those are um, not usual to get in a five level. And um, we'll talk about that a little later. How do you approach them surgically? Uh, you know, the, we kind of break it up into above the clavicle or the supraclavicular approach or below the clavicle, the infraclavicular approach. Uh, we do have some good videos on, um, it's called um, the uh, HSSE Academy. 